Okay, good, good morning everyone and welcome to the 19th meeting in 2014 of the Health and Sport Committee. I have received apologies this morning from our convener, Dunk McNeil, who is unable to be here today. As usual, I would ask everyone in the room to switch off mobile phones and other wireless devices as they can interfere with the sound system and disturb the meeting. Some members and officials are using tablet devices. This is instead of hard copies of their papers. Our first item on the agenda today is subordinate legislation and we have two negative instruments before us this morning. The first instrument is the National Health Service Free Prescriptions and Charges for Drugs and Appliances Scotland Amendment Regulations 2014, SSI 2014, stroke 115. There has been no motion to annul and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has, made no, has not made any comments on this instrument. Assuming that there are no comments from the committee, uh, is the committee agreed to uh, make no recommendations? Yeah. Okay, that is agreed. Thank you. And there's a second instrument before us also. And the second instrument is the Food Hygiene Scotland Amendment Regulations 2014 SSI 2014 forward slash 118. Again, there has been no motion to annul and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Assuming once more that there may be no comments from the committee in relation to this matter, is the committee agreed to make no recommendations? Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. That is also agreed. And we move on to agenda item two. So uh, the committee returns to look at our themed work on health inequalities. And we're taking evidence today from the Minister for Public Health on Equally Well. Good morning, Minister. Uh, so we have before us Michael Matheson, Minister for Public Health, Donald Henderson, Head of Public Health Division, Aileen Keel, Acting Chief Medical Officer, and Dr. Fair. Oh, no, we don't. <laughs> Look up before you read your notes. We would like to have Aileen Keel, Acting Chief Medical Officer. I don't know if, she, if she'll be along later. Oh, no. Okay, so we don't have Aileen Keel. Uh, but we do have Dr. Fergus Milan, who I'm sure is a much more suitable replacement. Uh, Dr. Milan, he says no. Um, head of the Creating Health Team, stick to your script, Mr. Doris. Public Health Division, Scottish Government, all three of you are most welcome. Thank you for coming along this morning. Uh, Minister, I believe you've got a brief opening statement. Yes, uh, thank you, convener, and I welcome the opportunity to, dis to discuss the second review of Equally Well, our national policy on health inequalities with the committee. I'd like to start by recognising that Scotland's health uh, continues to improve, uh, but I'm also acutely aware that despite the significant effort of this and previous administrations to tackle health inequalities, it remains a blight on our society. Uh, this committee has acknowledged the complexity of resolving Scotland's health inequalities, uh, the committee has also recognised that it's not a problem to be solved by just the NHS and all parts of government and the wider public sector have a role to play. Despite the challenges, we remain determined to address the social inequalities that lead to health inequalities across the whole of the country. When I re-established the task force, I wanted to ensure that we built on uh, the previous work. The task force agreed to consider uh, changes uh, in the way that people and communities were being engaged in decisions that affect them, the implications of the Christie Commission, and how place uh, had an impact on people's lives. The task force heard evidence that while the health of Scotland was improving, it was doing so more slowly than other European countries. It heard that conventional approaches to the problem that involves uh, attempting to modify the health-related behaviour of people have not had a significant impact. It heard that the level of deaths in 15 to 44-year-old uh, age group uh, was signif a, significant, uh, a significant contributing factor to the relatively poor position of Scotland's health in a European context. And it also heard that despite many similarities, Glasgow and the west of Scotland were experiencing more deaths than comparable cities and regions in the UK. It also heard evidence that people's immediate environment plays an important role in their health and well-being. Following consideration of the evidence, the task force identified several priorities, and I would like, with your permission, convener, to reflect on these briefly this morning. I think the most important area uh, that we need to focus on is around uh, issues relating to social capital. What I mean by this is the knowledge that in our most deprived communities, there are individuals, families, 
and even at times whole communities that have become more isolated and excluded from the mainstream. They do not engage in the same way that more resilient individuals and communities do, and they do not take advantage of the services provided. And too often, we engage with them on our terms rather than their terms. I'm not suggesting that all hope has been lost. Uh, committee members will all have their own personal stories about people, families and communities that, despite the odds, survive and thrive. However, what I am saying and what the task force is saying is that we have possibly forgotten how important the development of social capital is and that we don't spend time if we don't spend time raising it, we risk failure in the future. I think this was also widely recognised by the Christie Commission, uh, which argued for building personal and community capacity, resilience and autonomy. It should be a key objective of future public service reform. This uh, leads on to our next priority area, which is the support for community planning partnerships. Equally well has, from the outset, recognised the potential of CPPs uh, to make a greater impact. Our community planning partnerships are moving closer to realising this potential, but we need, they need our full support to achieve our shared ambition. The task force also picked up on two important elements that the evidence said was important. We heard that the 15 to 44 year old age group was showing many more deaths than uh, when compared across Europe. We know we have lots of activities and strategies in place that impact on people in this age range, but we want to check that this was having a coordinated and joined up uh, approach. This work is underway, uh, started by the former CMO, uh, Sir Harry Burns, and Harry uh, has insisted on uh, continuing to be involved in this work uh, for at least the next uh, few months, despite his new appointment. We also saw the remit of the task force. Uh, as you'll see from the remit of the task force, we specifically wanted to look at the role of place and the impact that could have on people's lives. It heard evidence from good places, better health work, uh, which we had recommended that neighbourhood quality standards should be developed. It was noted that colleagues in the architecture and design team were refreshing their policy and planning to include the development of a place standard. This was published in June last year and the development of a place standard is now underway. Finally, it was clear to me that the regular two-yearly review by the task force is not the best way to drive forward delivery. I therefore intend to take forward an alternative uh, arrangement which will bring sharper focus uh, and more frequent focus on the problems which we face in this area while also supporting our CPPs. And I'm more than happy to discuss this in more detail with the committee this morning. Great, thank you very much, uh, Minister. And we move to questions from MSPs. First question from Aileen MacLeod. And uh, thank you, uh, Minister, for your uh, opening remarks. Now, I know from the, um, the task force that it was very clear in its report that the problem with health inequalities in Scotland can't be solved with, obviously, health solutions alone, and that health inequalities are caused by the entrenched problems of poverty, educational underattainment, worklessness and poor mental well-being. So can I ask um, the Minister if you could perhaps um, maybe sort of set out what you think have been the successes of the equally well um, review as far as, and also in terms of what you think have maybe been the biggest barriers um, so far between um, the least and the most uh, affluent groups? Well, I think the uh, principal success of equally well has been providing a focus on uh, health inequalities in a way that wasn't there at a strategic level in the past. Uh, and it has allowed us to uh, give a, a degree of focus which uh, I think is important in helping to try and create the change that is necessary uh, to tackle health inequalities much more uh, effectively. I think the challenge with Equally Well has been uh, the, uh, the way in which um, it has largely been seen at times as being a health response to tackling health inequalities. Uh, and uh, the barriers which it's experienced has been the tendency to see it as a health-based approach to tackling these deeply ingrained social inequalities within our society. 
And the uh, principal barrier that I think that we have to challenge much more effectively in going forward is to uh, make sure that all uh, aspects of government, all aspects of the public sector, see it as being a priority for them to tackle inequality within our society, because it's these social inequalities that drive the health inequalities that come about as a consequence uh, of uh, this. So the uh, principal barrier, I think, is the, is the, uh, is the problem of it too often being seen as being a, 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 it requires a health response, whereas it requires a, a much wider response across a whole range of different agencies in a concerted way. And a key part to achieving that is to secure uh, the necessary um, uh, support at a senior enough level within these organisations to see it as being part of their day-to-day -day business in tackling uh, inequality in whichever form it may present itself in the work that they undertake. Thank you, Minister. One of the, um, I know you said in your opening remarks, you talked about there being um, alternative arrangements for coordinating the work to tackle health inequalities. I wonder if you can maybe give us, give the committee a bit more detail about how you see the work of the task force going forward in terms of these alternative arrangements. Well, when I uh, re-established the, uh, the task force, um, uh, it was the first time I had chaired the, task, the, the, the health inequalities task force, and I wanted to uh, reflect after the process had been completed if I felt there was a, a, a better way that we could try to drive forward delivery, because delivery is absolutely key to moving this agenda on. And uh, I came to the view that uh, a ministerial task force every two years uh, and then publishing a report from it wasn't necessarily the best way to achieve that, particularly if we are to get the type of step change in the work that we want to see happening within our community planning uh, partnerships and the support that they will need in helping to achieve that. So uh, the approach I intend to take forward now is the, uh, the Health and Community Care Delivery Group, uh, which has uh, up until recently been responsible for the last couple of years in taking forward the integration agenda because it brings together a whole... Uh, range of different organisations from local government through to health, through to the third sector, government and other uh, interested parties, is to uh, use the Health and Community Care Delivery Group, uh, uh, which meets at least four times a year, as being the uh, lead group that will now take forward the approach to tackling inequality uh, within our uh, society. And the uh, Health and Community Care Delivery Group are supported by um, uh, uh, several uh, uh, subgroups which have specialities uh, and which uh, submit papers to the uh, delivery group, uh, evidence-based uh, papers uh, on areas that they think are priorities that need to be taken forward. And in creating this new uh, approach, we have created the uh, Inequalities uh, Action Group, which will be responsible for undertaking that type of uh, uh, research-based work, then submitting that uh, to the delivery group with recommendations on areas that have to be taken forward, and for the delivery group then to look at taking that forward on a, on a continuous basis. So the principal objective I want is, uh, is to try and uh, create a process that continues to move it forward and brings together all the different stakeholders. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, in doing that, I think it can help us to try and get better delivery uh, on the ground and to make sure that we have all of the necessary stakeholders uh, uh, given it the level of priority it's necessary on a continuous basis. Just so members know, I've got Colin here to be followed by uh, Rhoda Grant. Colin. Yeah. <coughs> uh, thanks, convener. Uh, morning, Minister. Um, my question is actually in terms of the community planning partnerships, local authority engagement and, and all of this, which is obviously quite important. And uh, it's <coughs> the way things are moving forward, are we getting a uniform uh, approach from all the community partnerships, obviously with tweaks here and there for their local difficulties, if you like, or local uh, problems? Uh, or are we having serious problems elsewhere? Or what's the position with them? Because I've found in different uh, settings, you know, community partnerships are approaching things in a different way. I think, um, you know, right from the very outset, as I mentioned earlier on, um, equally well recognised the importance of community planning partnerships in taking forward this area uh, of work. 
Um, I, I think there is a need to make sure that we see that happening in a much more systematic way in the most recent task force report highlights that. As you'll be aware, there have been uh, some changes made to community planning partnerships and in order to uh, uh, embed them much more effectively in how uh, planning takes place at a local level in the delivery of services. So, for example, in the Early Years Collaborative and uh, the way in which community planning partnerships have helped to uh, bring together different services much more effectively from education through to social work to health and looking at early years much more, uh, 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 much more in a much more coordinated way, and also in taking that forward at a, uh, a local uh, level. And uh, some of the feedback we have had from community planning partnerships from the uh, uh, task force work is that there is a greater recognition uh, of the role that they can play, and there is a, a growing understanding of that. But just saying that they should do it, I don't think, is enough. And part of the uh, what that we've also uh, we're also taking forward is uh, is through Health Scotland, who will be uh, given the role to uh, help to support and advise uh, community pl planning partnerships uh, on this particular agenda, uh, and to provide them with materials uh, and support in the work that they are uh, taking forward uh, within their own individual community planning partnerships. And alongside that, the work that we are going to do with the the health and community care. A, a, a delivery group uh, in order to uh, help to support community planning partnerships to take this work forward uh, much more effectively within their own local area as well. So I think if there's um, uh, 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 anything, I think I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that community planning partnerships recognise the role in this area much more effectively. And I think some of the measures that we're going to take forward off the back of the most recent task force report will help to support community planning partnerships to do that much more effectively. That's not to say there is a one-size-fits-all. Um, it's to allow community planning partnerships to take an approach that best reflects the needs of their local community, but to make sure that it's been given a level of priority and that they're getting the support that can assist them in delivering on the inequality agenda much more effectively and going forward. Can I? It's actually to ask you to expand, and you were saying on the issue of... Um, is it architecture and the likes planning, making <clears throat> it's a thing in uh, many local authorities where regeneration of uh, areas is coming about. And obviously, one of the problems that we have with uh, the equalities and stuff like this is um, where people live in the environment. And some of the planning applications that go in, I've never, as someone who used to be on the City of Edinburgh Council Planning Committee is very little would come in and say this actually would help people's health. This is just a building that they are doing a planning application on. How much, and I, I do understand it's an ongoing piece of work, but it's the first time I've heard about it. If we're talking in terms of um, sending in the tasks uh, or getting a report done about the effectiveness of local authority regeneration and health and the knock-on effects, in what shape is, where are we going with this? What, what's the, uh, what's the, the line of action that uh, is being looked at just now in terms of getting this right when uh, local authorities are looking at regeneration areas? Well, in the evidence that we received in the task force, um, uh, uh, the issue of place and, uh, it was a, a significant factor that was highlighted to us uh, in the in the local environment that we create for individuals uh, and families and communities, uh, which led the, uh, to the task force's recommendation of the need for a, a place standard that reflected uh, this area of policy uh, thinking. And the concept behind it is that if we uh, if we design and plan these areas in a much more effective way, then they can have a positive impact on uh, someone's health, but also about the type of community that it creates. So, for example, I saw in my own constituency uh, developments take place, but they are developments that have taken place at times that uh, offer very little in terms of uh, creating that type of community uh, place as necessary that can bring people together uh, and facilitate that type of connectedness uh, within communities. Um, so the uh, work that was already, there was already some work getting done by the uh, uh, architecture and design uh, section within the Scottish Government in reviewing the existing 
uh, uh, place standard uh, guidance that existed. So we have taken the opportunity uh, to work with them uh, off the back of the task force's report to look at how they can take this area of work forward based on evidence that we received. They have now engaged with a, a range of stakeholders and uh, my understanding is they've held several meetings with stakeholders, which is from the health side, from the, uh, from the, the building uh, industry side, uh, uh, from local government side as well, uh, uh, planning, uh, all to look at how they can develop this concept much more effectively and the guidance in this area much more effectively. Um, uh, there was a, uh, so those meetings have taken place and that consultation is ongoing. What they're now doing is trying to work up some of the draft details of that. Uh, and uh, although we don't have a specific date for when we expect it to be completed, uh, we're hopeful that there will be a new place standard uh, agreed by the end of this year, uh, uh, which would allow us to then roll that out to uh, local, uh, uh, local authority uh, colleagues. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's based on the evidence which the, 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 the task force received about the need to make sure that we plan these issues and plan and deal with these issues much more effectively uh, in, in taking forward regeneration or housing developments uh, uh, because there is a, a body of evidence that demonstrates that it can have a significant impact in helping to tackle issues around health inequalities within uh, communities and a new place standard to, should help us to achieve that here in Scotland. Well, I think, thanks for that, because it's something that uh, I think has been not worked on terribly uh, in, a, in a very large way through local authorities over the years. I know it's in an awful lot of reports that they bring up, but I'm not 100 per cent sure of what they produce is actually uh, working. But that's, I really look forward to the, uh, the work being completed in that. Thank you. Um, Minister, just, just um, a small supplementary on, late in a second, Rhoda, you're, you're next on the list, um, on, in relation to community planning partnerships and place standards, and I was quite taken by the idea of social capital and community planning and the role of place and, and, and community empowerment, if you like, in relation to this. Um, I'm just wondering how, community panel, how local community planning partnerships really are. That there, there could be a danger, and I put it, you know, don't want to overstate it, that community planning partnerships bring stakeholders from, you know, from the NHS, from the local authority, from police, from fire, who are senior officials and managers, and they come up with strategies for local communities, but the actual proper real engagement with local communities might not be meaningful, and it might be tick, a tick box exercise. I'd be keen to see some assurance around that, how that's taken forward. I can just give you one example, Minister. Um, in the area I represent, I declare an interest because I stay in this area, so in Somerston, in, in Glasgow, there was a community amenity which was an, a centre for adults with learning difficulties. Now, that centre closed. Um, I don't want to get into the, the reasons behind that. that. That's happened now. But it's a significant community amenity which could have been used for the benefit of the wider community. And the local authority has taken a decision to declare it surplus, which they're entitled to do, of course, Minister, and to market that property, which, of course, they're entitled to do. I don't want to get into the rights and wrongs of that. However, in terms of a community being engaged with a bit of significant local community amenity, they may not they may not have felt it's part of that process. And I suspect that's not a Glasgow thing, incidentally. I suspect that's a local authority thing across the country. So it's about how you make sure that communities feel empowered at a local level and consulted with at a local level in a meaningful way where they are co-producers of what will happen in their local community rather than observers who are consulted on a statutory basis rather than meaningful and deep. And if community planning partnerships are the model to make that happen, how, how local does that community planning get and where will the power sit in relation to that? So I think the key aspect to this is to make sure that our community planning partnerships are much more focused on delivering social capital that I mentioned earlier on, and that is about uh, doing things with communities around two communities uh, and to use the assets that are within that community and to use them for the benefit of the wider uh, community. So that's the area of work that we need to take forward with our community planning partnerships to make sure that they're doing that effectively. So if I, I, I can give you an example, again, in my own constituency where we had a very good community-based initiative taking place, what happened was that the uh, local authorities' officials coming in took over management of it, and many of the very positive projects that had been developed by local members of the local community very quickly withered on the vine uh, because there was no longer that community buy into it. It was their project, 
the approach that they were taking to meet the needs of their local community, uh, rather than the council coming in or some other statutory agency, health coming in and saying, this is what you need, this is what we're going to do. So a key part of the work we need to take forward with our uh, community planning partnerships is to make sure that they see the role of the different statutory agencies is not to go in and do things to the communities, but to look at how they can work with the local communities to realise their potential and to use the assets within their local community. There's aspects of that already taking place in different parts of the country. I visited several projects where you can see this, uh, this happening. So it's trying to change that cultural approach to doing things to communities rather than with them. Uh, and the work that we're looking to do, so for example, from the, uh, uh, the Health and Community Care Delivery Group is how we can support community planning partnerships to achieve that. The uh, work that we're also doing through the National Community Planning uh, Group as well, of which I'm one of the ministers that's on that, to help to support our community planning partnerships to ensure that's the approach that they are taking. So I think you've made a very important point and the, the key, I think, to achieving the type of change towards much more in the way of social capital within local communities to make sure that our community planning partnerships are working in a way which is to help to engender and to support that, uh, rather than to go in and just do things uh, or to do things over the head of local communities that they think are the right things to do for them. So that, that's helpful. And I won't ask any more questions, but it would be helpful if you could perhaps um, write to the committee and give more information on what best practice would be in relation to how local decision-making can be assured within community planning partnerships. I know that's a cross-portfolio concern because Derek Mackay, I think, is the relevant minister in relation to that as well. And even particularly with the reference, because Harry Burns is very very, very strong on, you know, you know, uh, an asset-based approach to, to community development in relation to disposal of community assets from from uh, local authorities as well, and what best practice in that would be. And it does seem as if we're drifting off the health agenda, but right at the start of your opening statement, uh, it was about the importance of place, the importance of social capital, and the importance of empowerment. So if there's anything you can maybe give the committee in writing in relation to that, I, I, would, I would be very grateful. More than happy yeah. to do that. It's worth keeping in mind is that um, this approach is based on the uh, evidence that the, the, the task force received when it looked at the comparative evidence between uh, areas in West Central Scotland compared to that have gone through similar periods of deindustrialisation, that have got similar demographic profiles, etc., uh, to other parts of the UK and Europe. And the whole issue of, and one of the standout issues, is the issue around social capital uh, that is different from these. Uh, uh, particular areas, and that's why it's been emphasised to the task force. It's been an area we have to give much greater focus to in going forward if we're to close down some of these inequalities. Okay, very much appreciate that. Rhoda, thank you for your patience. Rhoda Grant. Um, thank you. It seems, I think we're all disappointed that we haven't made any inroads into the health inequalities that we suffer in Scotland, and I suppose it's even more disappointing when we see that other countries have. Can we learn what other countries have been doing? Can we learn from their successes? What are they doing that we maybe haven't achieved? So that goes back to the point, for example, some of the work that the uh, Glasgow Centre for Population Health have been looking at and the comparative data work they've been doing with uh, uh, areas uh, uh, similar to uh, uh, West Central Scotland, say the Glasgow area, uh, that have gone through similar periods of deindustrialisation, similar uh, backgrounds, etc., uh, but the health outcomes or the inequalities have been uh, different uh, going uh, forward. And they've also been doing some of that in comparative work with other European areas that have gone through similar periods of deindustrialisation. And uh, uh, some of the work that's been taken forward by Professor Kana, uh, Carol Tanner, her owner team, have identified areas where there are differences. Um, so if I recall correctly, and uh, 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 Donald or Fergus can correct me if I'm wrong in this, but uh, two areas that they identified when we were doing some of that comparative work uh, with uh, areas in Glasgow and other areas in the UK uh, where there was a marked difference in number of people who, uh, uh, who volunteer within the local community and were also uh, uh, engaged in their uh, local churches. And it's not a case of saying, look, go to a church that will help your health or close down inequalities or volunteer and resolve this. But the key issue was that they had uh, a value within the local community, that they had a contribution to make to the local community and they valued that role as well. And that was about that sense of place and that issue of social capital uh, that they actually have. And that's the uh, uh, difference that they've been able to identify uh, between uh, areas in West Central Scotland and other parts of the UK and other parts of Europe that have gone through 
similar uh, levels of deindustrialisation. So um, there's also been speculation about as well as a, a particular Scottish gene that creates this, but it is worth keeping in mind that up until around the 1950s, you know, Scotland in terms of its uh, health compared to other European countries was that we were pretty much middle of the road. We were pretty much in amongst the pack, uh, being reasonable since the uh, 1950s uh, uh, through into the uh, 1980s that that difference has started to uh, become much more exacerbated. So, uh, uh, so I think it's, there is no quick fix to this. Uh, there is no single agency solution. It's not simply about providing uh, more uh, 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 health interventions. It's about changing that issue within some of our communities that will help to deliver that type of sustained change in the future. And based on the evidence which the, uh, the task force received, the issue of social capital and the issue of place are key factors that stand out as differences with other parts um, of the UK and uh, Europe, which have gone through similar periods of deindustrialisation. I, I suppose that surprises me because some of the communities um, that we have where health inequalities are at their greatest, yes, they're poor communities, but they're also quite strong communities. They've got a, you know, they're recognisable with, with, with strong senses of community. And I'm just wondering, what have we done or what aren't we doing um, to empower those communities? Because I think it would be quite easy um, to get people actively working within their communities if if we were enable if we were to allow them to do that and kind of trust them with some decision making. I know in Norway they have a program of community empowerment and I'm wondering if we should be maybe looking at that to see if we can learn lessons about how you can put those levers back to communities. I, I think community empowerment is a key part of it. Uh, and, and community empowerment is about um, it, it, it's not about just saying that communities are empowered to do it, it's about giving them the scope to be able to, to do that. I, I visited a project in Fife um, uh, last year, if I recall correctly, uh, and it was a, a project that was supported by Inspire Scotland. Uh, and um, uh, it was nothing sophisticated uh, or fancy, uh, but it was uh, an area which was a, a, a traditional uh, uh, mining area uh, that there was a very significant level of inequality within the local community. There were um, uh, the uh, rather standard assets within the local community in the form of there was a community centre, there was a school, etc. But there was, prior to this project starting, was very much, there was very little that was actually run by the local community itself. There was stuff that was done by the health service come in and run some sort of clinic, uh, which you call it. There was stuff that was done by community education where they come in and they ran some stuff for uh, uh, some of the local uh, kids. But there was very little being done that was run by the local community. And Inspire Scotland uh, uh, set up a project was to, uh, was to uh, support the local community to identify what they wanted to do within their local community and to then look at providing them with the resource to allow them to go and develop that and to take that forward in a way that hadn't been there before. Uh, over the course of that project, they then developed into what the local community did, was they had they organised different groups themselves, uh, from cooking groups through to bike repair groups to uh, uh, an allotment programme for older people within the local community. They then started their gala day. Their gala day hadn't been organised for years. Uh, no one was interested in doing so. And all of these things may not sound as though they are, they are, the, they are that it's silver bullet, but it was all about helping to connect the local community, to allow them to identify the issues that they saw as important to them, to then take them forward and to allow them to manage that and to do that in a way that best reflected their uh, needs. And I think there has been a tendency in the past, um, at times done for the right reasons, where there has been this view that we, we, the agencies are meant to go in and do things rather than actually being seen as being enablers and helping to support communities to use the assets that they have to take forward things that are a priority to them that they see as being important. And I think if there's something that we have lost, it's, it's the, the value of that social capital um, and how we can re-engender that in communities where uh, that has been lost. And based upon the evidence which we received um, uh, during the course of the task forces, uh, work that was seen as an area that we had to give priority to because it stood out as a difference to these other areas that, uh, that uh, parts of Scotland could be directly compared with. 
and the issue that you've mentioned in Norway, I think, around uh, community empowerment is a good example of that type of social capital uh, happening within communities where people can take control of things and do issues that are, take forward issues that are of a priority to them. Uh, and we need to look at how we can engender that much more effectively in our own communities in Scotland. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Richard Simpson to be followed by Nanette Millen. I think that, uh, Minister, I'm sure you share the disappointment that we all have that really since the Parliament started, we haven't actually narrowed that gap. Um, health has improved in every sector, but the gap has, hasn't improved. Um, it's interesting that the latest report focuses on the social capital, uh, and it's not an area I, I disagree with at all. I think it's a very important area. But if we look at the history here, just to take two examples of social capital that was being developed and hasn't really uh, been followed through. One was healthy living centres, which was one of the concepts in the first parliament, and yet the number of healthy living centres has gone down quite considerably. Some, of course, will fail, and that's entirely appropriate, but it would be interesting, it would have been interesting to read in the report some of the evidence from the earlier part of the Parliament to see what has succeeded and what failed. Healthy living centres is one of them because that was undoubtedly an area where, with some professional support, individuals were coming together to try and tackle their problems. The second one is the Retired and Senior Volunteer Programme, RSVP, which again had a number of um, uh, professional staff but they were supporting an, a lot of volunteers who were then developing programmes. The only one that survived, actually, is in Forth Valley, in, in our respective constituencies, where they still have, because they raised money externally, and they still have the national organiser coming in. But it's the only one that's really survived. And yet, that was creating, as you said, quite simple things like walking groups. There was a knitting group. There was, there was there were, you know, there, these things you, don't strike you as being big things, but they are social capital. They're about... What I think in your report is described as uh, uh, bridge, bridging social capital or linking social capital. These are things which are absolutely fundamental to the structures in our society. So I'm disappointed that the report hasn't looked at the things that have not succeeded. Um, and then the other thing is to see you know, where we actually have had successes. So, uh, um, for example, the Salsas reports are indicating that the levels of drinking and smoking in young people has gone down, although there are a group who are drinking very heavily. So something's happening in terms of what Sure Start, Home Start, and all the early years stuff, followed up by the collaborative is following through. So I think my question to you is, uh, great that we're now talking about social capital as being important, but you know, where's the detail in terms of the analysis, uh, either in reports as part of the social, as the part of the uh, single outcome agreements. What reports are there in the local authorities? I can find very little. Uh, what reports are there that health is putting money into the development of social capital through the third sector? Because again, I don't see that. I see excellent high level stuff here, but not the detail that I would have expected at this stage and after 15 years of the parliament to be saying this has not succeeded from the labor years or from the early SNP years. This is succeeding and looks like it's coming through. There was uh, some work done by Health Scotland in looking at some of the aspects of uh, what has been achieved around tackling health inequalities. And there's also been the work around Keep Well uh, to evaluate its effectiveness. And you'll be aware of the government's position on Keep Well and going forward because of the challenges, been able to evaluate the benefits that can actually come, uh, has actually been achieved from. Uh, that approach. I don't know whether Donald might want to say a bit more about what Health Scotland looked at than the, the, the report that they commissioned in, in looking at some of the aspects around uh, tackling health inequalities in Scotland, which may address some of the issues that you've mentioned, uh, uh, Richard, in relation to the um, uh, areas where progress has been made and, aid, and, and what has made a difference and what hasn't uh, made a difference as well. I, I think a, a key part uh, is to, uh, when you mentioned the single outcome agreements, we have aspects in the single outcome agreements that we agreed last year about community planning partnerships and making sure that inequalities are seen as being a key part of that whole process. Uh, the challenge is to turn that into real action. Uh, and that's why I think we need to take, from my perspective, a slightly different approach in looking at how we can deliver this and how we can drive that forward much more effectively, which is why I've set up, uh, under the Health and Community Care Delivery Group, a process that can help to support that, 
but also by getting Health Scotland to look at the work and the support that they can provide to our community planning partnerships to support them in driving that work forward in their day-to-day -day processes as well. So I think if we can get some of these factors right, we can then make sure that the decisions that are being made at a community planning level uh, are looking at aspects, so for example, if it's the, uh, the Healthy Living Centre is the most effective way in which to take forward delivery of some of that approach, then that might be the approach that's appropriate within that community planning partnership area. And that community planning partnership build, should be looking to take an approach that helps to support and achieve that. But I think what we need to do is make sure that community planning partnerships clearly understand, get the support that's necessary and what they should be doing to encourage social capital and to look at how they can then deliver that on the ground. And I think, to be perfectly blunt with you, that has not happened. It simply has not happened. Uh, and my uh, clear view is the reason that it's not happened in the past is because health inequalities have been seen as being the NHS's responsibility. Health inequalities are the consequence of social inequality. And if we don't tackle that social inequality, we're not going to deal with these health inequalities effectively. Now, there are aspects, and I think you make a good point about our health service, seen as also being a health promoting health service, rather than just being a health service that treats ill health. Uh, and a key part of that is the role that the health service can play in working with its strategic partners in local authorities and in the third sector in order to help to support and build social capital. For example, some of the work that has been taken forward under the Change Fund uh, for reshaping care for older people has actually generated social capital. I know within my own constituency uh, that the partnership there between uh, NHS Four Valley and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Falkirk Council has enabled a number of uh, projects to be taken forward which are actually of benefit to both the health service and to the local authority, but they generate social capital because a key part of it is volunteering and being engaged in delivering something within your own individual community. The challenge is to sustain that going forward. So rather than looking at it from a perspective of actually it's better if the council go in and do this or it's better if the health service go in and do this, actually it's better to work with a third sector organisation because we can engender social capital by doing that, by bringing volunteers and others into delivering some of these types of issues that we need to address going forward. And that in itself has the byproduct of creating social capital, which is of benefit to the local community. So that changing our mindset around how we take some of these things forward, and um, I don't underestimate the challenge in, in changing that uh, cultural perspective that we too often have from our statutory bodies is that we have to go in and uh, do things. So um, uh, that approach, I believe, will, will deliver change in the future. And you mentioned some of the, the targets and, uh, that, that will be set around this issue. We have set, for example, around the early years collaborative, some early targets to measure progress that is being made. And we can already see some of the progress that's being made there, which um, you know, all, the, all of the committee, I'm sure, will appreciate is absolutely crucial to changing things and going forward. And some of the early year collaborative work, I think, will be tremendously beneficial uh, in, in, in future uh, years. But we need to make sure that's happening in a systematic way. And the initial indications is that that's starting to happen in a fashion that wasn't there before, and some of those early targets are about trying to uh, achieve that. The other thing I, I would say, finally, for having Donald in here on the, the Health Scotland report, uh, I would say is that a lot of the work we're doing around trying to close down health inequalities, around smoking cessation, uh, alcohol uh, uh, misuse, etc., that work will all continue. That's all key to trying to rebalance our relationship with some of these issues within our society. And you're right, the census report does so show some very encouraging signs around our uh, young people's attitude towards alcohol and, and tobacco. What we need to do is capitalise on that. Not reinvent another strategy, but capitalise on the things that are working. And we know that there are some aspects of policy that are working around uh, children. Some of the work that we're taking forward uh, around the new, um, uh, the new uh, uh, tobacco control strategy is about capitalising on some of the good practice that's been identified that we know is influencing young people in their behaviour around uh, smoking um, as well. So it's about trying to, yes, share the good practice, the best practice, encourage that where we can, uh, but also to make sure that we change the mindset of those within our statutory sector in particular, that working with the third sector can actually have a significant benefit in creating that social capital within our communities uh, and they've all got a part to play in helping to 
uh, deliver that. Maybe if Donald can maybe mention a bit more about the Health Scotland report, which may address some of the other specific points that Richard raised. What, what Health Scotland were looking at, Fergus may be able to come in on, on some of the detail, but what Health Scotland were, were keen to look at, work led by Dr Jerry McCartney, was, was looking at understanding what sorts of health improvement work, health inequalities work, what actually does drive the change that we want, what both improves health and reduces health inequalities. Because we know that there have been some initiatives that have improved health for certain parts of the population, but ironically have increased health inequalities because they haven't always been accessible or effective with the bottom 5%, 10%, 20%, it might be the people who are at 30, 40, 50% who have, who have been gaining uh, most. So uh, Health Scotland were able to produce a report to analyse things that have happened here and, and elsewhere uh, in the UK and, and worldwide to look at the types of intervention that both improve health and reduce health inequalities and, and what might well reduce health, but ironically increase health inequalities. And what they were able to do was offer us that, that background um, for the work of the, of the, um, of the group. Um, and it was quite clear that where you're looking at price and fiscal matters that that does, which of course the parliament has some powers over, but only, uh, but, but more limited than in some areas. It, aspects of regulation, these, are, these are, are good when they are appropriate. They are good in terms of both reducing health inequalities and, and improving health. But some of the things that often can feel right to us in terms of the approach, in terms of um, citizen education, for instance, the people in, in the population who are best able to take advantage of that often are not the people who we're actually trying to target in relation to health inequalities. And, and that can widen the inequalities uh, gap. And, and it may be that a bit of what's been happening, or at least the fact that we haven't been making improvement, has been that one, one factor in a very noisy environment out there, a very complex environment, is that some of the work that we've been doing has been helping the people at 30 and 40 and 50 per cent, rather than the people at 10 and 15 and, and 20 per cent. Um, so that, 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 that provided a backdrop. I'm not aware, um, I have to say, but Fergus may be able to correct me, of Health Scotland looking specifically at the two examples that, that, that you mentioned. Um, if, if they did so, they would, it, was, it was in the undergrowth, as it were. It was very much in the backdrop of the research. We can certainly ask them about that, though, and, and write to the committee and, 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 and let you know. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't think they covered that in the report um, uh, at all. Um, and there's nothing really more to add. I think Donald's covered and the Minister's covered what um, Health Scotland said. It, it, maybe just helpfully, in terms of the Inequalities Action Group and how we're actually planning to progress that, it's meeting for the first time on Monday properly. Um, so I don't want to really second guess what they'll conclude in terms of the rule and remit and how they'll work. But how we imagine it working is a paper that's produced will cover what's actually currently happening. Um, in the local authorities, what's, what's already good? Because we know that there's a lot of activity out there that will contribute towards uh, what we're trying to achieve. Um, it, it will also look at what, what are the political, economic, social and technical costs? What, what's holding us back doing this? What's in the way? Do we understand what's in the way? And try and present that to the, the group so they can look at the evidence, what's currently happening, and they can be reassured in many cases that often they will be doing some of these things already but it's maybe just how they actually then approach it and how they scale it up or how they uh, fit it in and coordinate it with their activity. Yes, I, think, I think mapping is absolutely critical. And, of course, some people, have, some local authorities have produced directories of things that are out there, and I think that's absolutely vital that we have a comprehensive mapping in relation to the CPP. If they don't understand what's going on in their communities, they're not going to be able to deliver any of this. Uh, and, and just to take Bob Doris's point and give two examples from my constituency, an old bing in, in near Flynn, uh, the RSPB have been in and, and supported uh, SNH as well, supporting them. Volunteers from Flynn coming up, and actually that bin has now been carpeted. It's got butterflies and, and, and birds and all sorts of things. They're keeping the birch back, and it's all being done by the volunteers in the community. So it's exactly the sort of thing I think you're talking about. On the other hand, go across the fourth to, to Alawa, and we've got a centre at Hawks Hill, 
which is a physical building. Now, I agree with Bob entirely. The local authority has to manage its estate in the best way it can, but they're proposing to close a, a Hawks Hill Community Centre, which has 22 groups operating out of it, without saying where those 22 groups are going to operate. And I think Bob's point was, if the adult learning people are not going to use that centre, what's happening to the other groups who may have also used that centre? So there needs to be a, a sort of uh, integrated, integrated uh, 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 planning. But I, I certainly would welcome the fact if we could get some report after the meeting on Monday as to whether they're going to A, map, and B, also look at some of the historic things that have been tried and see, I mean, community schools is another one. It's supposed to integrate psychology and, and schools. You know, look at what happened in that first parliament and the early part of the, the second and third parliaments to see what actually was being tried and what didn't work. Okay, Richard, thank you. And if you could do that, Minister, that would be helpful. And it's difficult to chastise my colleagues for bringing up several local examples when I indulged from the chair and did likewise. So um, good for getting that getting that on the record. Uh, I should also perhaps add, uh, before I bring the net in, that I think some of the healthy living centres have actually went on to be developed into mainstream provision within local authority yep. areas, and I can think so. They, they haven't disappeared. In some cases, they've been embedded into the fabric of, of local community provision, and I'm thinking about the Healthy and Happy Centre in Canvas Lang in, in particular, who's who are currently flourishing, and I've done it again, Richard, to put another local thing on the, yeah, no, on, on the record. Yeah, so, uh, uh, again, the patience failed. of our colleagues, uh, Nanette Millen, to be followed by Richard Lyle. Nanette. Well, I won't be raising any local issues, you can be assured of that. Um, <laughs> just to say, what, what actually does concern me is this unacceptable mortality rates in the 15 to 44 um, age group. I mean, we all know the outstanding importance of the early years and, and prevention at that stage. Now, I noticed from last year's uh, report that the sta task force sta thinks that maybe they'll need to consider a framework approach building on the early years collaborative, but focusing on the uh, people as they progress through life at sort of, you might say, pinch points or, or uh, like transition from primary school to secondary school, like transition from secondary school to, to work. And I mean, I, I know in other contexts, you know, with the, in disease groups, how important transitional years are. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on, on how to progress um, with that. Yeah, I think, Kim, uh, you know, this was an issue that uh, the, 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 the task force spent a lot of time considering because uh, if you, if you, we know there are a range of factors that contribute to the uh, uh, excess mortality between for the uh, 15 to 44 year olds, alcohol, drugs, violence, um, all of which contribute to this uh, uh, agenda. Suicide uh, are all uh, significant contributors. Uh, to this particular area and uh, all of these issues are all complex matters that have to be dealt with in an appropriate way. Uh, some of the work around how we can, uh, because it's not a demographic group that we have a strategy for um, uh, as such. Um, so some of the work that we were keen to explore is whether there is something that we could do in a more systematic way uh, around this particular age group, but also to look at the other areas of work that are already taking place that would have an impact on uh, this area, this age group itself, so the violence reduction stuff uh, that's taking place, the what has been done around uh, drugs and alcohol as well, and the, uh, the suicide prevention uh, strategy, to look at whether something we need to do in order to uh, uh, draw some of that work more closely together, and that's some of the work that um, uh, the uh, former uh, chief medical officer had already started looking at and is continuing to look at for us and should report to us in due course around what measures, if anything, that we could take to try and draw some of this work more collectively together. So I would say to you is that once we have uh, Sahari Burns' uh, report on this matter, that will give us a clearer understanding as to whether there is something that we could do that's more specific around this demographic group, given that we already have a range of policy areas in this area to tackle some of these matters, but to give a particular focus in on the, uh, uh, on the 15 to 44 year olds, which if we made significant inroads would have a very significant impact on uh, what you call it, life expectancy in Scotland because of the excessive nature of it. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, there is a, would you call it? so once we have that body of work, we'll be in a position to be take, a, take an informed position. I would expect that to be something that would then go to uh, the, the, the delivery group uh, to consider how that can be taken forward. Any idea of the timescale of that? I think uh, the, the 
group met about a week or so ago, um, and they're just beginning to formulate and get, because they're gathering a lot of colleagues together to discuss what's actually currently happening. And I think they're looking to try and pull some work together after the summer. I'd be interested in the, the outcome of that, and I'm sure you'll update the committee. I'm happy to keep the committee updated on that thank, as well. Thank you very much. Nanette, thank you very much. Uh, Richard Lyle to follow by Gil Patterson. Thank you, Convener. Um, basically, I've listened to many of the points the Convener has made this morning, and also Richard Simpson, and I agree with uh, the, what works locally, local groups, etc., um, should be supported rather than the council or the big brother coming in and saying, oh, let's change it to do something else. So I agree with many of the points you've made earlier, uh, Minister. The task force had made changes to the areas of priority and action as the strategy has progressed. Given that this strategy has only been in place for six years, is there a danger that there's not enough time, that not enough time has been given to allow actions from the original strategy time to bed in before moving on to, as I would call it, new flavour of the month priorities? So the, the objective, though, for the task force is, um, uh, is not to just say, let's forget what's happened in the last six years. It's about building on the bits that we know uh, are making a difference, uh, but also to consider the areas that aren't making a difference and to recognise that and to acknowledge that um, as well. So the, the approach that we are going to be taking forward is it's not a case of uh, uh, creating a new strategy. It's about building on the bits that we know that can make a difference based on the evidence that we have received uh, and, to, and to take that forward. I think there's a... Uh, uh, you're right, there is, a, there is a, a, a danger that we get into project itis, that we support something for a period of time and then all of a sudden uh, decide that that's it, um, the project's run its course. Yes, it worked, but that's it coming to an end. Uh, and we need to try, if we're going to tackle this area, uh, I think in a way that can make a difference in years to come, we need to be into it for the long term. And everybody who's got a part to play needs to be in to it for the long term as well. And that's why community planning is absolutely key to delivering that. Um, and uh, uh, so I hope I, I can reassure you it's not about a new strategy, it's about building on the bits that we know work uh, and using the evidence that we've received in order to give particular focus to the areas that we think we can get better gain from with a much more strategic approach and supporting that at a national level through into our community planning partnerships. Comments and I welcome the point that it is building on what previously what what does work and, and all too often from a previous experience, you know, we had a uh, a project and then suddenly the funding ran out five years later or whatever and then uh, oh that was great but uh, we'll move on to something else. So uh, I totally support the points you're making. Thank you for that. I think it's got to be sustainable. Uh, the approach we take for the, the for example the approach the, the the example that Richard offered about in Flynn. Uh, and the Bing uh, is a sustainable approach to creating social capital within your local community. Uh, and uh, that doesn't mean that you have to have lots of resource going into it for the long term. Uh, but what it does mean is that you can create the type of connectedness and, uh, 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 and the, the, the type of social capital that can make a difference in the long term by uh, giving the right type of support in the place for that to happen. Um, and... Uh, Sometimes it's small practical things that can make all the difference. Sometimes it can be just simply getting permission from the local authority to be able to use a particular piece of land or a particular building for a particular purpose that the local community feel can make a difference, empowering the local community to be able to do that, um, that can make a difference. So it's about, it's about making sure that, you know, it's not about just saying there will still be projects that will happen and if they don't work, then we should disinvest from them uh, if they've not got the outcomes that we we're looking for them to achieve. But if they are going to be sustainable in the future because they make a difference, then all of the stakeholders have to recognise the value of that and to look at how they can support and enable that to happen. That, that also has been my experience over the years, that basically you don't need a lot of money. You just need people to buy in. And, and basically, things that have been worked locally by local people, uh, when the council comes along for the council to listen rather than direct or... or, or channel them down another route, basically, that, you, know, and I, I, you know, the points that Bob, uh, Doris and, and Richard Simpson made this morning are what, what works locally is when you, you get local people to buy into it, rather than the council coming in and, and saying, well, this is what you do. So thanks for that.
Can I just, just as an example, a very small example, given that the others have given examples as well in my own constituency, uh, a new housing area in my constituency, a new community school built in the local community. The biggest battle was to get the padlock taken off the gate of the area for the kids to be able to use it when the school wasn't in use. That, was, that took months to eventually get that padlock, padlock lifted from the gate. That was a community school that was built. But what happened was it then became somebody took ownership of it and saw it as being their school. And the community, it was there for a, as a community asset and the community wanted to use it. And they organised themselves in order to use it. The biggest battle was getting the padlock taken off the gate. That's the type of small thing that can make a difference in terms of generating that type of connectedness and that involvement within your local community. No, it's fine. Thank you. Okay, and and uh, I'll move to a, a final question from, from Gil Patterson. Feel free to mention a local constituency initiative if you wish, Mr Patterson. I might actually do something more than that. Um, maybe, maybe it's uh, two questions I've got. First, I, I think maybe it's an observation. I mean, uh, I take the view that although this Parliament's been working extremely well in these areas and doing all it can uh, but in, in all administrations, I, I don't think this administration is doing more than the last administration. Uh, but I see it just as a holding operation with health inequalities that, that there's, we're making a difference. And I wouldn't for any minute say that we shouldn't put the work in that we're doing because I think it would be terribly worse if we didn't. But I think we really need to tackle the real problem here, and that's poverty. Without us taking on poverty, we'll continue to be here discussing this uh, forever. I, you know, if, if, if we look at the causes and the impacts and how it, poverty works, it, it just touches everything. It touches schools, employment, lack of employment. And so to make the change, I think what we've got to do is uh, provide uh, or, or you know, break the cycle of poverty. And I think that will make the step change. And that's an observation. I don't if you want to comment on that, Minister, feel free, because what, what I really want to talk about is social capital with my own experience. But feel free if you want to talk about, uh, put it on the record, about what your feelings are about uh, maybe the lack of powers that this place has to make the changes. I, I completely agree. Poverty is a, is a key part of tackling this uh, whole challenge. I can remember uh, back in the last session of Parliament, and, uh, and, and Richard Simpson was on the committee at the time as well, when we had a presentation from uh, uh, the chief medical officer uh, in Stirling just prior to the, when the just after the 2007 elections when the committee uh, was coming together and his um, his his annual report that year uh, its its principal recommendation was about creating hope in communities um, uh, the picture of the mother with the buggy in the end of a tenement building in in Glasgow and uh, I was quite struck by that at the time. And that was all about, it wasn't about trying to find a health solution to these issues. It was about creating hope and aspiration in these local communities and was an absolute key factor to tackling some of the health inequalities that, and the social inequality in our society. And poverty is a, a major contributor uh, uh, towards that. And that's why we need to take a, a systematic approach to it. That's why uh, we need to make sure that all aspects of government um, are pulling in the same direction in order to uh, achieve that. Um, and where one bit of government goes off at an angle that undermines the work of another, uh, then we are effectively uh, running to stand still. Um, because if you, if you don't tackle poverty effectively, uh, then you know, if, you, if you've increased in child poverty, despite a lot of the work that we're doing through the Early Years Collaborative, uh, in order to uh, reduce or to improve the opportunities for, uh, for uh, children in their early years. Well, if you've increased in child poverty, you're undermining that work. We need to be able to coordinate all of these aspects so that they're all pulling in the same direction, whether it be welfare, anything else, in order to achieve that much more effectively. Uh, I mean, uh, what you've, you've done there, Minister, is the determination uh, that this administration uh, is currently engaged in. And I, I do agree with that, and I, I, I pay the same compliment to the former administrations with the determination uh, that, that they've been uh, showing to, to tackle that very thing. I just believe we don't have the powers to, to do the, to finish a job. That's my, my firm belief uh, from what I see happening and what's happened 
in the past. But what I want to talk about is uh, Harry Burns raised it when, when we had him along, and you, you raised it yourself. And it's the social uh, capital and social cohesion. And it, you know, I've I was uh, born in Springburn and left Springburn at the early age of nine years of, of age. And I can tell you, that Springburn had work uh, there, employment was available. There was cafes, sweetie shops, chip shops, snooker halls, cinemas, department stores, dance halls, swinging, swinging baths, laundries, uh, grannies and uncles and relatives. And I was moved to the Milton Scheme. That's where my headquarters still is. And my doctor is still in Egglesay Street in, in the Milton Scheme. And all I've just mentioned there doesn't exist in the Milton Scheme. It's not there. And so, therefore, you've had this scheme roughly the size of Perth, and people used to having these facilities and having their neighbours. In Springburn, if there was a death, people would put around a sheet and you would collect to help the family. In the Milton, done, finished. Didn't happen. So, therefore, if, if we look at the west of Scotland's problems, I'm betting that the west of Scot Scotland's problems, just like the Milton scheme, are in the schemes where where it's corralled. Because right now in the Milton scheme is just what I've described. There's a few churches there, there's a couple of rows of shops, and virtually nothing else. There's a, I think there's swimming pools in the schools. So that if, if we are trying to compare uh, the, the proposition in the west of Scotland compared to somewhere else, where the, the, really the community spirit has been really ripped apart, then I don't think you can compare that way. It's how you, how you can, how you can uh, get social cohesion and engagement and hope uh, in these areas. You need to provide some of these things. I'm not saying you, because you know, that would be ridiculous. But I, I see that as, as the missing evidence, that, that we kind of make an assumption that the, the, the West of Scotland is somehow unique when really social <coughs> cohesion was destroyed. Uh, and how, how you put that together again, I find very difficult to, to understand how that works. And, and that's uh, a lot of the type of evidence that the task force uh, heard, uh, is that it's... Uh, it's not simply about providing uh, uh, more in the way of uh, health uh, interventions in terms of smoking cessation programmes, alcohol brief interventions. Um, it was about uh, creating that type, that form of social connectedness, connectedness within local communities that uh, clearly uh, has is not there to the degree that it should be, and the, the benefit that can come from social capital. And as I said in my uh, opening comments, I think we have. Uh, uh, we have forgotten the value of social capital. And if you look historically about where Scotland was at over the last, uh, the, uh, the last uh, couple of generations, is that it's not a genetic thing uh, as such, um, uh, but our society has changed quite a bit and some of our communities have changed quite significantly over that period of time. And there are certain factors that do stand out. And the uh, challenge in going forward, I think, is... Uh, it, it's not just about um, well, is a community centre there or not. It's about how is the community centre utilised? How does the local community manage the local community centre? Is it run for their benefit? Or is it run in the terms of what the council thinks should be providing the local community centre? Uh, does the health service in the local area operate in a way uh, that's there purely for the benefit of how the GPs want to operate or to, uh, uh, to do so in a way that can better reflect the needs of the local community? These types of issues... Uh, and I think if we can empower local communities much more effectively uh, uh, over a sustained period of time, give people that sense of hope and purpose within their community as well, and the value of the local community, then in bringing these types of issues together, we will create that level of social capital that's necessary. That will take time, and everybody has to play their part. You know, I hear continually uh, uh, challenges about uh, Scotland closing down its health inequalities, we will continue to fail to close down our health inequalities if we don't effectively tackle the social inequality that affects our community, poverty and all of the other factors. Uh, those health inequalities will continue to blight our society. And that's why I believe that we need to take an approach that is about building that social capital within local communities that will help to engender that change in future generations and years to come.
I mean, I don't want to make this political, but I, I just can't help it. I mean, I've got a vision and, uh, you know, a way that we can, you know, put some of these things in place, but you need lots of power and lots of money and determination to do it. And my challenge isn't to you, to be quite honest. I mean, we're coming up to a big time in, in Scotland's history. Somebody's got to sit somewhere else and explain to me, without having power, how you, how you get these things into the Milton scheme. Because I think without real power to make a determined change, it will be like that in 30 years' time. That would be my prediction. I'll be dead and gone by that time. But I've been hoping for changes to the Milton scheme almost my whole life, and it's never materialised through different administrations. Westminster, Holyrood, SNP, Labour. You need the powers to change, or it will never change. It's been, a, it's been a morning for men mentioning local matters. You mentioned Milton. It actually ties in quite nice with the idea of a mapping exercise that you were referring to previously, because it's an area that I know very well. It's part of the area that I represent. And within that area, you've got uh, a church-led organisation called Love Milton. You've got an active trade union and Unite community branch doing work in the community. You've got a youth club called North United Communities. You've got Glasgow Community and Safety Services running something called Ashkill Recreation Centre, taken back from gangsters, quite frankly, because of a brave councillor called Billy McAllister. But the point I'm making, Minister, is there's lots going on, but there's still lots needing to be done. But there's lots going on from various stakeholders not always working in a joined-up fashion. So I think that brings us back nicely to the idea of... Uh, the mapping exercise and, and, and getting it right, but I think that probably came full circle in terms of mentioning local lo, local initiatives. Can I can I ask you if you want, you want to comment any further on Mr. Patterson's um, comments there? No, I think uh, Gil makes a uh, Gil Patterson makes a very valid point about the the challenges. And as I say, if you're trying to close down health inequalities, but policy elsewhere is yeah. exacerbating child poverty, yeah. you are under uh, yeah. you're under undermining aspects of your work uh, that you're trying to take forward. And I think uh, committee members won't mind me saying that the passion that Gil Patterson spoke with, it's evident that there's a, a united support in, in this committee, irrespective of our views on powers, to, to, tackle, these, to tackle these issues. Uh, do you have any final comments, Minister, before we, we close this part of, of, of the meeting? No, other than to welcome the committee's uh, particular interest in this matter, and there are several points that we will uh, come back to the committee on that you asked for us, and also areas where we can keep you up to date in, in some of the work that we are also taking forward as well. Uh, uh, to help to inform your ongoing interest in this area. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all, all three witnesses for coming along to the committee this morning and we'll suspend briefly for five minutes or so.
Okay, welcome back uh, to the Health and Sport Committee meeting. We now move to agenda item three, which is consideration of the Food Scotland Bill. Uh, so we're going to continue taking evidence in stage one of the Food Scotland Bill. So we have another round table this morning. Um, and it says in the interest of time we won't do introductions, but I think we will do some introductions. So uh, we'll go round the table and we'll, we'll, do, we'll uh, maybe say briefly who you are, which organisation you're from. So I'm Bob Doris, Deputy Convener of the Committee and a member of the Scottish Parliament for Glasgow. Laura. Laura Stewart, Director for Soil Association Scotland, which is part of the UK's membership charity campaigning for sustainable food farming and land use. Richard Lyle, MSP Central Region. Uh, Charles Milne, Director of Scotland, FSA. Lynette Milne, MSP for North East Scotland. I'm Dave Watson. I'm the Head of Bargaining Campaigns for Unison Scotland. Uh, Gil Patterson, Member for the Scottish Parliament for Claybank and Mulgay. I'm John Lee. I'm Public Affairs Manager with the Scottish Grocers Federation with the National Trade Association for the Convenience Store Sector in Scotland. Colin Keir, MSP for Edinburgh Western. Richard Simpson, MSP Mid-Scotland and Fife. Colette Blackwell, Director of the Food and Drink Federation in Scotland. We represent food manufacturers, large and small, uh, in Scotland and the rest of the UK. Rhoda Grant, Highlands and Islands MSP. Tim Smith, Group Quality Director, Tesco. Ailey McLeod, MSP for the South of Scotland. OK, thank you everyone for that. And you're most welcome here the, oh, still this morning, uh, not afternoon yet. Um, when we go to, to questions uh, with answers, I will give priority to... to, to uh, guests here this morning over members of the Scottish Parliament, so come and have your say. This is your opportunity to put your thoughts on the on the public record, but I'll go for the first question to Gil Patterson, MSP. General question uh, with the onset of the Food Standards Scotland, and it's just to find out in your own, with regards to your own uh, views, uh, what the ups and downs uh, are uh, with the prospect of this uh, coming into being. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, clearly, the ups are that uh, the new food body will be able to be much more cognizant of the Scottish landscape, um, but that doesn't come without risks that need to be managed. Um, what has caused uh, concern for uh, people across the UK, I think, uh, is, is the management of incidents, which by their very nature, uh, and the nature of the food business, um, need to be managed on a UK basis. But it's been very clear right from the start that uh, the, the chair and chief executive of the FSA uh, and ministers in Scotland have recognised this and have given the commitment that we need to work very closely together. Uh, and SLAs and MOUs will be drawn up to ensure that that happens. And of course, there's parallels in animal health uh, uh, where animal diseases are managed on exactly that basis. So we, we have no reason to believe that that shouldn't work. I think the other area that's recognised that there is risk, but again is very manageable, is the access to expertise, both in terms of scientific committees, but also expertise within the organisation. And again, that cuts both ways, because we have uh, expertise in Scotland and areas like shellfish, which are of use to the rest of the uh, UK FSA, uh, and there are areas of expertise uh, held in uh, London, um, Cardiff and Belfast that we need access to. So again, that can be managed through appropriate MOUs. Watson? Yeah, would we support the creation of them? We, we, we understand that there, are, that there is a potential risk, but um, frankly, the arguments against um, having a standalone body in Scotland could apply for a whole range of devolved uh, areas, uh, particularly regulatory functions already devolved. So I think um, it's particularly important that we have it devolved because of the tie-in with the, with the other matters that are already devolved to Scotland as well. So we support that. We'd also support it, I have to say, because we don't feel that the the UK FSA has always got the balance right in terms of the balance between consumer protection and brand protection and the safety of the consumer. We think sometimes that's drifted uh, too much in, in the way of the of meat producers and less emphasis on, on safety for consumers. So we hope that having a Scottish body will put a proper focus and get the balance right. OK, thank you. Our witness wanted to come in in relation to that. Mr Lee? Uh, thanks, uh, Kim Buna. Um, I guess... Uh, our main concerns were about ensuring consistency of advice and guidance and enforcement action, uh, particularly around potential um, food incidents. We also had a concern about how the European dimension would be managed. Uh, we had a question about whether or not uh, 
the FSA UK would continue to be the lead body at a European level and how that would negotiate on, on, on behalf of um, Scottish businesses, uh, particularly in light of the potential uh, result in the referendum. So we thought that the, the European dimension was a potential overarching issue uh, and one that could um, do with some f further exploration. Okay, thank you very much. Laura Stewart. Thank you. Yeah, we also support the creation of this new food body for Scotland. Um, I think there's some potential benefits in how policy uh, is looked at from a food perspective in Scotland because it can be quite confusing and I think this gives it a, a real chance to air where that policy is being set um, and to make sure that we're being properly linked up. So it's not just about food and health but it's also about food and sustainability because actually health of individuals and health of individuals of our planet are, are linked at the end of the day. Um, so this gives us a good chance, I think, to look at what we can do better and perhaps look at how other uh, systems around the world work. So, for example, in Sweden, it's normal to talk about healthy and sustainable food and to give advice around both of those things at the same time. OK, thank you very much. Tim Smith? Um, yeah, we have uh, shared the successive Scottish Government's vision of ensuring customers have got food that they can trust and, more broadly, Scotland food and drink, I think, has been a tremendous boost to the industry and to consumers, including our customers, and nothing matters more to us than them. Um, so if we're thinking about how we ensure that we sell the best quality products that say are safe, taste good and a great value, then um, what's proposed is pretty much in that direction at the strategic policy level. Um, the things I would tick off as being achieved largely in the design are uh, those that the architects of the FSA in London contemplated too. So transparency, the fact that science and evidence will play a huge part in, in what the organisation does. It appears on the face of it to be proportional and risk-based and there's some question marks about whether that will then apply to some of the enforcement regimes, but that's the second order problem. And the independence that allows um, the body to stand away from the, uh, the parliament, the government itself, and effectively, I think, to be able to be trusted more by consumers and therefore our customers is all good news. Um, as regards the FSA committees, there are, I think there are currently 11 or 12 advisory committees, and it will be important, as I think it's con contained within the, the bill, that the access should be as good um, as it currently is for policy makers uh, north of the border as it is south of the border to work on uh, both those committees and then as others have mentioned the more acute problems of incident handling would be very good to know that if there's going to be an incident and uh, let's hope there isn't one that consumers will be able to trust whichever body it is that's giving them advice because they'll be using the same evidence taking the same proportional risk-based approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Smith. Colette Blackwell. Sorry, Blackwell, I apologies. That's, that's fine. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to start by saying that we've had a very positive relationship with the FSA Scotland across all of its activities, and we'd really, we're very keen to see that continue. But in considering the scope and remit of the new body, it's important to take into account the nature of the food and drink manufacturing industry. Companies that sell food products in Scotland are not all based in Scotland, and indeed, food manufacturing companies that are based in Scotland export the majority of their products elsewhere, not least of which is south of the border and the rest of the UK. Sales to the rest of the UK are a vital part of the Scottish Government's food and drink policy, and it's important to be aware of the breadth and size of the companies that operate in Scotland, in particular the SME nature of the companies that tend to exist in Scotland. So with all of this in mind, there are a number of, of um, issues that, that we would like to be considered. Uh, the first and possibly the most important is the consistency of the approach to enforcement, a proportionate approach that is consistent across the UK wherever, wherever possible, and that the new food body should try to ensure, as Charles Milne has set out, that there are appropriate mechanisms in place to continue to liaise with other bodies and committees across the UK. Um, the, someone else raised the, raised the issue of the voice for the industry in Europe, and there are some questions about how that will be achieved once the new food body has been established. Um, access to scientific advice, I think uh, Tim alluded to that. It's important that the new food body has robust peer-reviewed evidence on which to base its decisions. Um, it currently draws heavily on other committees and groups as part of the FSA UK, and the, the point about ensuring that those mechanisms still exist is very important. Um, with a very broad remit, a new food body could um, represent many diverse stakeholder groups, so there's something about ensuring that 
potential conflicts of interest are managed. And last, but certainly not least, is it must be adequately resourced to ensure that it continues to fulfil the functions that it was established to fulfil. Thank you. I have to say, that opening question seems to tease out all the issues within the bill there. Uh, <laughs> one, one, one fell swoop. Um, uh, Gil, it was, it, was your, it was your initial question. A lot, a, lot, a lot of potential risks, but opportunities as well. Yeah, to come back it's, in. it's only opportunities. I just wondered if, you, if the panel thought, since uh, Scotland's got an, an enormously high uh, reputation for safe food and quality food, uh, would, would this hinder it, or do you think this would add to the brand? Is, this, is there a way, or, or is it just in terms of... Uh, is it cost-neutral in terms of... Uh, does it add or subtract to, to the image of good quality uh, products from Scotland? I did see Mr Millen, but I'm actually going to, if it's OK, ask Mr Smith first of all, because during your answer I did scribble down something in relation to opportunities over the, the, the quality of, of Scottish food there, and I think that links in quite closely with uh, Gil Patterson's question. So Mr Smith, and then maybe Charles Millen after, if that's OK? Yeah. Um, we have uh, 170 producers in Scotland, um, and they're producing for us 1,600 products. We sell £2.1 billion worth of Scottish produce across our UK markets. And there's nothing, I think, contained within the way that the bill is shaping and the way the body's, I imagine, going to work that would do anything to slow that progress down. I, I can't imagine why that would happen. Um, what manufacturers, and Colette will speak better for manufacturers than I could, will want is a very clear line of sight to any new policies. They'll want plenty of time to think about any changes. But ultimately, our producers, I think, and I, I would hesitate to speak for them, but I will, they will want a level playing field. They'll want clarity of purpose and evidence base to back up what's, what's happening. But since I first wrote my little note here, we've added another 10 producers to our list of Scottish producers. I can only imagine our business growing with Scottish food and drink producers. I can't imagine why it would not. Thank you very much, Mr Smith. Uh, Charles Miller? Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Um, one of the uh, things that has not been mentioned yet is that the new food body will be charged with putting the consumers first in everything it does, and that's really important. But to deliver for consumers, we have to work closely with industry, because at the end of the day, we can have all the policies we like, but it's industry that produces the food that we work. Uh, and, a, and actually, consumers' interests and industry interests uh, align. So industry wants to produce safe food. It wants to produce food that it says what it is, it is on the label. Um, uh, and that is really important in developing consumer confidence and thereby allowing uh, industry to grow and underpinning Scotland's land of food and drink. And I'll give you two examples of where in the past that hasn't worked. So uh, in 2009, we had the instance where uh, the export of white fish from the UK was banned as a consequence for, uh, to Russia as a consequence of a visit of their inspectors. And more recently, we've seen exports of cheese from the UK banned uh, by China, again, as a consequence of uh, a visits by their inspectors. And, and it seems to me, talking to industry, that they want uh, a proportionate, uh, fair enforcement system. They want the reputation of Scotland underpinned by good regulation and effective regulation. Uh, and I believe that the new food body gives us the opportunity to deliver that. Thank you, Raj. Any other witnesses want to come in on this point? Uh, Clay back there. Yeah, really, just to add to Charles' point, I think the key, the key to what Charles was saying, he, he actually made my case very well for me, and I won't reiterate that, but it, the key to this is effective and proportionate regulation. And Tim's point about engaging often and early with industry stakeholders is well made. Watson, you want to come in? Yeah, I, I think um, certainly uh, having proper regulation does add to the brand. Sometimes it's, it's argued that um, you know, the brand is all, but the brand is only as good as you know, the not being a scandal. And as something goes wrong, as Josh rightly said, then that damage takes years to put by. So our view is that that brand is best protected by having rigorous regulation. Uh, and our concern in recent years, in fact, your committees had a proposal put in front of it on pigs, for example, whereby the proposal is to only be a visual inspection of pigs so that tumours and abscesses are minced into, uh, into the pigs without meat inspectors being able to, uh, to cut those open and inspect them properly. Our view is that that's a move to light touch regulation and we know from the banking and other scandals that light touch regulation is not uh, a, a good, the right way forward. Yeah, now, 
uh, in danger of dropping a tangent about how we deal with the, the pig issue, which I never thought I would see at the Health and Sport Committee. Uh, Mr Millen wants to come in on that point, I suspect. Yeah, I, I really would. I mean, I think um, it's worth mentioning that the current post-mortem system that we have in abattoirs is, is based on a system that's <laughs> over 100 years old, and science has moved on since then. And I totally agree that we need appropriate regulation. I think that the, the staff on the ground in abattoirs are doing a fantastic job under difficult and trying circumstances. But it is about delivering what's right for consumers. So uh, I, I think that a lot of the conditions that we currently look, for, uh, look at uh, are quality issues, uh, not public safety issues. And the uh, purpose of the change in the regulation is to move away from quality inspection to safety inspection. So, what are the modern challenges? Salmonella, Campylobacter, uh, E. coli, they're, they're invisible organisms on carcasses. So we will not pick them up by cutting into uh, lymph nodes. We need to change the system to suit the challenge of the times. Uh, and work we've been doing in Scotland just uh, in the last six months, in September we had carcass contamination levels across Scotland about 4%. We've introduced an initiative that by March had delivered uh, a reduction of 50% to 2%. That's the difference that will make a difference to public safety. Uh, and it's being delivered by our inspectors on the ground. But it has to be driven by science. I don't know if you want to come back in then any of that. Again. I mean, there is a difference of a view on this one. Our inspectors are very clear. They say there are many, many examples of, of without vision, without actually being able to cut in, that what simply happens is that things, and I agree, it's not hugely a health issue, it's a quality issue. But, you know, we're talking about the brand, then quality has to be important as well. There are things which are now going into the meat process which, um, which the consumer, if they saw them, would not want to see in their sausages. And that's, that's the reality of where we're going. You know, I'm going to bring in Mr Smith and I might move to another question unless Mr Parson wants to come in with a supplementary. Uh, Tim Smith. i broaden this out a little bit and suggest that um, the trust that our customers have in our brand and therefore in the, uh, the brand of Scotland Food and Drink is only enhanced by having competent audit checks, safety analysis, the whole, all the way through the supply chain and Dave Watson's organisation provide, men, many of their members are doing that work. My encouragement to them and to others is to continue to press to have their role because the, the, the consumer, the, cust, the customer that matters so much to us has trust in a government body acting as a regulator almost as much as they do in the, the individual retailers, some of whom represent around the table and manufacturers who also do a good job. It's a complementary system and Charles is right about the science and the proportionality, of course, but what matters to customers is to be able to trust the food they're eating and that they'll know that what's on the label is actually what's in the pack. That's quite a nice bit to, to end that section, but there's emphasis not just on safety but also on quality because that's where the, the brand opportunities come in. Gil, do you want to come back on any of that? OK, uh, a new question from Richard Lyle, MSP. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, can I identify prior to... Uh, uh, just after leaving school, I actually went into the grocery trade. I was actually a uh, grocery manager for 10 years, so uh, this is the, the question that I want to ask. This bill introduces new administrative sanctions for food law offences. In evidence due to a question posed by me last week, William Hamilton, EHO from Glasgow City uh, Council, stated, prosecution is not a great option, so administrative fines or fixed penalty notices Call them what you will, would be a boon to us. However, I note that some witnesses today before the committee are not in favour of new <coughs> sanctions, in particular the Scottish Food and Drink Federation and also the Scottish Grocers Federation. Do, you, do the witnesses, other witnesses, agree with previous witnesses that the new sanctions set out in the bill for food law offences are a positive addition to existing sanctions? And if not, why not? OK, I suspect we'll get some... Uh definite replies to that. Who would want to go first on, on that one? I see that and then no one puts up their, their hand. Yes, Mr Watson, thank you. I, 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 you'll not be surprised that we're actually in favour and uh, not surprisingly as uh, the union that represents environmental health officers um, that our members are very clear that they welcome the new powers um, but particularly if I mean, you only have to look at how few prosecutions there actually are it's gotten to, uh, to know that uh, the, the issue to be honest is, is, is not largely about regulations we've got lots of regulations the issue is about enforcing those regulations uh, and that's particularly in, in, in the local 
local authority end of the business is that there's been a 17% uh, cut in the number of staff working for, in environmental health departments, a 13% cut of professionally qualified EHOs. The reality is that, um, that we are not inspecting food pre premises at the rate that we used to do so. And um, I, I, an MSP, I know, um, once said to me, well, could we have the European system where we put the inspection report on the door of every restaurant? And I said, well, we could, but there'd be two years out of date uh, for most restaurants, so therefore it's fairly pointless. So this is about resourcing at the end of the day. If we don't, we have all the regulation you like, but if we don't provide the resources to have the inspectors to do their job, then it's not going to be very effective. Thank you. And that is, of course, contained within the bill, putting the inspection report on, 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 the, on, the, on the publicly displayed in, 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 in every, every outlet. Uh, Mr Millen? Yeah, I mean, there are a number of uh, uh, legal measures proposed in the bill, and the first one is about the food hygiene information scheme, which is the one you're referring to, where the local authorities' inspections are converted into a, uh, a score on the door, if you like, either a pass or an improvement required. Uh, and businesses can display if they choose at the moment. I'm pleased to, to say that 31 local authorities in Scotland administer the scheme, and by the end of this month, all 32, including South Lanarkshire, will, will be in the scheme. Um, the, the argument is a better regulation one, and is that by making uh, uh, it mandatory to display certificates, uh, you actually provide the ability for consumers to make choices and put pressure on businesses wh which are improvement required to, to up their standards. Wales uh, are introducing a bill to make uh, uh, the, the uh, display of such notices mandatory, as are Northern Ireland, and we will have the opportunity to look at that in the future. I have to say that the power in the bill is an enabling one. If we chose to go down that route, it would need further consultation. The, the second area of legislation within the bill, uh, so I would, sorry, in summary, I would say I would support the, the, the measure in the bill in that respect. Uh, the second uh, area in the bill that's covered is uh, around um, uh, food authenticity. Uh, and, and this came to light, of course, with the horse meat incident. Uh, and it became apparent that uh, we have a number of measures for food safety that are not replicated for, um, uh, for all food identity. And again, the idea of that is to bring it into a line to give us powers to uh, seize and destroy, if necessary, food. Um, uh, that is not what it says on the tin. Uh, in terms of the notices themselves, uh, again, I would support. I think uh, you're, it's quite right that a number, uh, many local authorities don't take prosecutions. It's another tool in our armory. It's about, in my view, having the appropriate tools for the right circumstances and ensuring that the businesses uh, that are not playing the game and not abiding by the rules, uh, we can take action against effectively, thereby reducing the burden on the very large number of businesses that do trade uh, in a responsible way. And finally, there is another bit in the bill with regard to feed legislation, uh, and, and that I would support as well. Another, yes, it's a clip, Barrio. Yeah. On the back of those points, um, I think specifically in relation to the food hygiene information scheme, taking all of the points in in mind. Um, the purpose of that is to provide accessible information for consumers to make informed decisions. So I think th some thought has to go into what is the best way of doing that. And at the moment, I think we, we believe that the current scheme does it in a way that consumers can relate to. On the issue of food authenticity, I mean, we've, we've had a number of reviews since the original incident which sparked the discussions around all of this. Uh, we've had the Scudamore Review here in Scotland and we've had the Elliott Review um, in, in the UK. Um, the recognition from all of those is that the food industry works hard to deliver safe, competitively priced products. But we have to recognise that every supply chain is at risk regardless of its complexity or risk and we need to work collaboratively to address some of the issues. What we recommend is a whole supply chain focus on prevention of fraud, and as part of that, we've produced a five-step guide to protecting businesses from, from food fraud, which informs companies about the questions they should ask and the steps that they should be taking to ensure that they're not victims of fraud themselves. And companies want to do that. It's important to remember that. Um, we have also a number of incident prevention and technical committees uh, which assess um, sort of what's, what's happening elsewhere. And what we we're very supportive of is something that's come out of the Elliott Review, which is the concept of a government intelligence sharing hub, which would be facilitated by government because government is often the, the most effective repository, repository of information across all of the issues that can lead to food fraud and similar incidents. 
working with trade associations who can then feed into and off such a hub to ensure that we have the best access to horizon scanning data which might identify where such fraud might come from in the future. In watch, Mr. Smith. Yeah. Um, I'm privileged to know that successive governments in uh, Scotland have, have led their local authorities in this work in an exemplary manner. The 32 local authorities um, in Scotland do a, cr a very good job. And on the ground, that's the result of all the hard work of the, the various enforcement officers. Um, our view is that we want proportionate and evidence-based enforcement. That's pretty much, I, su I suspect, for all of us what we've got now. And nothing matters more to us, as you'd expect me to say, than, than that we're able to say that what is on the labels, what's actually in the pack. Um, Internally, as an organisation, we and uh, our manufacturers, I think, would, would be able to point to very robust testing regimes. And we know from the outcomes of those testing regimes just how stringent that work is, but how important it is to our customers. Um, my sense is that the food hygiene information system, uh, as it's been pretty much applied in Wales already, is helping customers make choices in areas where they might not otherwise have thought too carefully about hygiene standards, and I don't mean in retail outlets, it's more in catering establishments. Um, and our authenticity, I think Colette's covered the ground very nicely. Um, our, our sense is that only when you understand the whole supply chain and you've made it shorter and more transparent do you get a clear sense of where the risks might lie. And it's the outcomes for our customers that we would be contemplating when we are hoping to work with Scottish Government and others, the new food body here, in, in formulating how this will actually work in practice. And we're keen to help where we can. Mr. Laura Stewart. Thank you. Just yeah, on the food authenticity uh, point, uh, testing regimes are very important in, uh, you know, a very important tool in the toolbox. Um, but at the same time, they're not the whole answer. So we need to make sure that we strengthen our supply chain assurance schemes, which might be independent, obviously, of the uh, new body, and for that new body to acknowledge and support schemes, such as organic, but there are many others as well, uh, to help with that element. OK, thank you. Mr Lee? Just briefly, um, Mr Lyle's quite right to mention that we were not particularly in favour of um, civil, civil penalties. Um, in doing that, we had very much smaller independent retailers in mind. Um, idealistic, perhaps, but we hope that the new Food Standards Agency would be a, an opportunity to really develop um, a spirit of partnership between retailers and enforcement authorities. And in our response, we had mentioned the development of something called primary authority partnerships. I might say a bit more uh, about that later. Um, but I think it would be helpful for the committee to, to be aware of them and perhaps do some, some read across with different committees and different Scottish government departments that are taking primary authority forwards. Um, I think they do have the potential uh, to offer um, retailers and businesses who are operating in more than one local authority area to develop uh, new and very constructive partnerships based on guidance, information and advice rather than on potentially the new imposition of new civil penalties. It, it, it's, this thrown a couple of things for myself, but Richard, it was your question. Anything you want to follow no, up? No, ba ba basically, I, I welcome the, the comments by Mr. Lee. I know that, that, that as I say, previously being a grocer, uh, I know that there, there are many excellent grocers in, 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 in Scotland. And by the way, I'm not not looking for a job from Tesco. Um, but basically, the, the, the situation is that um, working as previously also being a councillor, working with EHOs, uh, I found that the, the environmental health officer wanted to work with you, come in and give you advice. Yes, could, could uh, um, be hard if he if so wished, but, or he or she uh, so wished, but most of the time they work with you in, in order. And, and I would let, hope that the, the, the Grocers Federation would encompass this new law. Thank you, convener. Okay, thanks, Richard. Before I move to a, another question, just on, on your theme, Richard actually contained within that, of course, within the bill, there will now be a duty to report breaches else, elsewhere. So I just keen to get a flavour on whether just now your view is that that happens anyway without a statutory duty to report or not. Um, I'll kind of what Colette Blackwell said, Blackwell said about um, 
how companies and producers and, and retailers can spot food fraud, because they could be the victims of it as well. But when you do discover it, it's about that duty to report, which is contained within the bill, which I think fits in nicely to Richard Lyle's comments. And also in terms, Richard did ask about the proportionate nature of, of fining. I think that came up at last week's evidence session as well. And I, I'm only mentioning Tesco, Mr Smith, because you're, you're sitting round the table. But if there's a breach and it's in a it's discovered not within the food chain, but within a, a local Tesco store. Um, any fine that would befall Tesco could be minuscule compared to a fine that may befall a small grocer uh, for something similar. So it's about how we make sure that the fine system is proportionate. And as Mr Lyle said, how we make sure that uh, uh, the local authority uh, uh, enforcement agency are actually still working in partnership. With, with, with their local businesses rather than just being there to find. So proportionate and duty to report, just because just they were quite specifics that you asked, Richard, I didn't yeah. quite feel we got that teased out from the answers. Yeah, Mr Lee. I don't quite have the answer to, um, to the question, but the issue for our members is very much one of um, consistency across, across local authorities. For example, a lot of our members now very encouragingly are, are uh, developing relationships with genuinely local suppliers, whether that's the butchers, the bakers or, or, or whatever. Um, we have members who may have uh, an arrangement with a local baker um, and some local authorities allow them an open display of, of bakery products, bread and, and rolls, whatever. This is very popular with customers goes down incredibly well, but I, I, I'm getting information from some of our members that in other local authority areas they're being told that that's an infringement of health and safety, that all the bread products have to be packaged. And this, for, for our members who operate across Scotland, this is, it causes them a lot of, a lot of hassle, a lot of, a lot of anxiety. So it's just this, I, this thing about consistency, whatever we have, it would be hugely helpful if it was consistency across Scotland, whether it's in terms of the civil penalties that are, that are being um, introduced or, or enforcement activity or whatever, uh, we have a big, big issue about different approaches um, to food and health and safety across different local authority areas, which hopefully uh, the new bill could help to address. Mr Smith? Uh, yeah, um, we support um, the government's, Scottish Government's approach to primary authority and we, we do that with enthusiasm because it just seems to work more effectively. That's on the enforcement side. I mean, I, I would just say, um, before moving off enforcement, that the vast majority of activity by food officers, enforcement people going on to uh, manufacturers sites and uh, retailers is actually advisory. They are doing a great job helping people do the right thing. And that obviously helps our customers and everybody else's. The requirement to notify, I think, I, it almost slipped me by because it's just such an obvious thing that should be a requirement. And um, it's usually a Friday afternoon, as Charles will tell you. Um, but it, it means that there is a, a clear sense of direction in any handling of any potential concern, whether it be fraudulent or food safety. And in my experience, our suppliers uh, do what our customers want them to do, and they act in a timely manner, in a proportionate manner, and anything that changed that would be concerning. But I don't really see anything in the spirit of what's being written here as being a potential risk to that if we follow that track of having a very clear primary authority type approach. That's very helpful because we're scrutinising a specific bill, so we keep trying to bring it back to the, the, the details of, of, of the bill for our own scrutiny. So that's very helpful. Collect back, well. Thank you, Convener. I, mean, I think this whole issue about the duty of, to report on food standards issue um, relates primarily to the very broad range of issues that can be covered by that duty to report. So at the one end, you've got the extreme case of has someone adulterated the food with something they shouldn't have done, through to the other end of the scale, which is perhaps mislabeling of a label through a printing issue or some other issue that's arisen during the production line. Um, so the question then is, how will that be managed by those who are enforcing it? Will there be a light touch approach to those which are genuine mistakes, genuine issues that have arisen through no fault of, of, of the individual's own, right through to what happens where it's cases of uh, reckless mislabeling and repeated failures to, to comply? 
So I think what, one of the issues that, that we want to see examined in more detail is the extent to which there will be guidelines and guidance for local authorities, for environmental health officers, for whoever's going out to actually to implement and to enforce these regulations as to what stance they should take. And if I could just finish this with an example, we ran a, a workshop last week for SMEs in Scotland on the new food information to the consumer regulations, and we did that in partnership with the FSA. And two things that really struck me about that were, first of all, that small companies quite often don't really understand what's coming over the hill at them, um, so they really do need a lot of support in any of this, however it turns out, to understand what's happening and how to implement it and what the penalties will be. But secondly, those who were ahead of the game and had started to explore some of the issues arising from that piece of legislation were saying things like, well, we've asked our local authority representatives, and within one local authority, we've had three different pieces of conflicting advice. So the key to all of this is to ensuring that there is some kind of consistency of approach and that we don't use a sledgehammer to crack a nut. That's helpful. Uh, Mr Watson, I'll take Mr Mullen after that. Yeah, I mean, we support the duty report. I think um, inspectors and regulators need all the help they can get in uh, in this area. So I think the responsibility of everyone in the in the chain is important. Um, we're not opposed to primary authorities. In, in evidence to the um, to the regulatory reform act, we pointed out some of the challenges that primary authorities give, particularly um, to smaller local authorities if they if they hold that, particularly in areas like environmental health and training standards. Some of the departments can be very small indeed with very small numbers of uh, professionally qualified staff so it's got to be the right authority uh, and it's got to be properly properly resourced um, in terms of consistency our, our view is that that's probably not best done by some top-down um, regulation from government that's better done by local authorities coming together uh, with the industry and producing national frameworks um, uh, and that's in our view the, the way forward and, and on the point of, uh, of partnership I mean our members are very keen on, on that approach. We did a survey last year of uh, environmental health officers, and one of the things that they were particularly concerned about was that because of the pressure on their time and reduction in resources, that what they were having to give up was the education and the, and the preventative work, uh, and inevitably focused more on being the, the, the policing of the function. And, and that's the worry here, is that uh, essentially if you haven't got the time to do the, uh, the education and the preventative work, you focus on simply being a policeman. Convener, you won't be surprised to hear that we strongly support the duty of reporting. Um, I, I hear what Colette says about proportionality, and, and my reassurance, if I could provide it to her, would be that, uh, you know, for the incidents we're aware of at the moment, they're dealt with very much on a risk assessed basis, and I would envisage that uh, uh, any duty to report would be treated in exactly the same way, so we wouldn't take the same uh, action for a serious health concern as you would for a labelling uh, issue. That, that would be how I would envisage it. But I think it's important for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, the, the obvious, uh, the companies or individuals may not report an incident to begin with, and that could then result in quite significant uh, potential uh, public health issues. Uh, but there are other reasons as well. Uh, um, we regularly receive reports um, where we're told that a, that a company in Fife or a company in Highland is doing something. Uh, but the individual won't tell us which company it is or provide any details that allow us to take any action. So, again, that, that duty would, uh, would, would enable us to, to, to get that information. And then the third area, I think, which uh, uh, would address is we have had examples recently uh, of companies uh, where they have reported, but they have delayed the reporting until the economic impact is minimised. So uh, delaying a report until after the best before or used by date uh, allows the, the product to go through the market to the consumer, whereas an earlier report would have actually prevented that hitting the consumer. Uh, my fellow committee members are not normally so bashful, but no one's intimated the wish to ask the next question. Do we, oh, Rhoda, Rhoda Grant, MSP. <laughs> um, I I'm wanted to ask about resources in the bill and, and the financial resources available. Is, is the resourcing adequate for the new um, authority? And if not, what can we do to... I mean, a lot of people are talking about the new authority taking on some of the health prevention work. Is it, is it sufficiently resourced to do that as well as look after the standards of, of, of produce we, we now have and, and the safety aspects that are already carried out by the Food Standards Agency? 
Okay, so resourcing issues. Help. Mr Mellon. Um, I mean, the objectives of the bill that are set out in the policy memorandum are, are extremely challenging. Um, uh, not only to make sure that f uh, food in Scotland is safe, but also that the diet and nutrition uh, is, it enables people to live longer and healthier lives. That, that in itself could require a huge amount of work. And you're absolutely right to flag up that uh, if considerable work is required, the resources have to be provided to do so. Uh, as currently laid out in the financial memorandum, the, the, the financial provision is probably adequate for the functions that the FSA currently undertakes, but there is a discussion on the future scope of the organisation and the potential to take on further work. And, and I think that if further work and further responsibility is allocated to the new food body, then the suitable financial provision needs to be made. Thank you very much. Mr Watson? Um, I, I think yeah, I, I wouldn't largely disagree with that. I think our concern in terms of resources is, is obviously not just in the FSA, but also in local authorities, uh, because the FSA only has one part of the role, role here. But in terms of the FSA, I think our concern is that uh, if resources are tight, then inevitably you start to look to cost cutting. There's been a, uh, a track record now over a number of years with the UK FSA, where there has been pressure to, to, to cut costs. One of those methods has been to essentially deregulate by transferring the responsibility for meat inspection from the independent meat inspection by FSA staff, either to contractors or directly to the, to the meat producers. Uh, and we think that's been a, a cost-cutting. I think uh, I welcome the points that Tim made about you know, Tesco's concern about the, the regulation must be seen to be independent. If you are a, a meat inspector employed by a meat producer, um, your approach to inspection is going to be different than if you're employed by the FSA as a government meat inspector, where you have that degree of independence. There is inevitably pressure on people employed by a company, uh, not just by the company, but by other staff working in the plant. And if you're an independent, inspector then you have that degree of pressure so I think our concern would be that if it's not properly resourced then we'll carry on down the road of cost cutting and effectively deregulation losing the independent nature of inspection which I think is so important for the Scottish brand. Very much Claire Backpill. Two points really the first is to build on uh, Charles's earlier point about extending the scope of the agency if we cast our minds back to May 2013 when the establishment of New Food Body was first mooted. There was a lot of discussion with stakeholders at that time about a large number of fairly meaty um, additional responsibilities, we pardon the pun, which could, which could come into the New Food Body. From the bill as it stands, the decision's obviously been taken for that not to happen, but it's really not clear where the additional resources for such functions would come from should they be incorporated into the new food body in the future. Mm. So that's, that's, that's something we're very keen to have um, some clarity on. The second relates to hidden costs. Um, the FSA Scotland is currently part of FSA UK, and it benefits from the synergies that that brings in relation to the committee structures, the research that's commissioned, access to other bodies, all of, all of that happening within a structure at the moment, which comes at no cost. Once the new food body is established, how will it access those same sources of um, expert advice, research, evidence, all of the things that are fundamental to delivery of, of a strong and effective food standards agency? And will those come at a cost and have those costs been considered? It's not clear to me from the bill as it currently stands that those have actually been actively considered. We've submitted our comments on the funding issues around the new food body separately to the Finance Committee. Um, unfortunately, it came after your call for evidence, but we'd be happy to share that with you if, if, if that would be useful. Okay, yep, that would be helpful. Uh, Rhoda, do you want to follow up on any of that? Um, I, I suppose just to say what additional funding would be required if, if any work has gone into looking at um, the new parts of the organisation that need to be set up. That, that won't benefit from the UK-wide organisation, HR, finance, all those types of things. I think it would be useful to get some idea of those costs because those will happen regardless of whether new functions are, are, are taken on by the authority. In terms of the corporate support, uh, that's been costed in, as part of the financial memorandum. Uh, in terms of committees across the UK, uh, they are UK committees and the, the new food body in Scotland would continue to have access uh, uh, after uh, a new body was set up. And I'll give you an example of where that's actually occurred. When nutrition transferred from the FSA to the Department of Health, 
the, the, the FSA and the UK basis took his advice from SACN, the Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition. Uh, after that responsibility transferred to DH, Scotland continued to have access to the committee, to its expertise, and still is able to ask appropriate questions for the committee to look under. And that model will uh, certainly be the case going forward. In terms of research, Scotland has its own research budget. It is part of, uh, plays a part of the UK uh, uh, research um, uh, programme, and I would see that continuing after the, uh, the new food body comes into being. So very much parallel to what goes on with DEFRA in animal health, that there's a, there's a get-together on an annual basis to coordinate the programmes to make sure they're complementary, there aren't gaps, uh, and to make sure you get as many synergies as possible. But actually, uh, with research, there are in increased opportunities when Scotland has its own ability to manage its research budget in terms of leveraging additional funding. So um, the, my main concern that I flagged up is if we brought in additional functions, uh, some of which are, are set out in the papers that we have from local authorities or, where else, or wherever relating to nutrition or whatever, if those additional responsibilities come in, then we need to identify what those responsibilities are, what they will need to you know, what resources you'll need to administer and deliver them, and then we'll need to cost it out and ensure those resources are provided. Mr Smith? Yes, well, three points. To add to that that colleagues have already made, the first is um, inevitably the fixed costs that are now going to be for Scotland alone are going to be significant to the point of needing to be identified and um, protected. So the new body will need its own systems and some of those systems will be shared for a while and some of them will not. What I would suggest would work best for us and for our customers and our producers is to be able to know with certainty that the most important priorities which the FSA and FSA Scotland now lay out very clearly are going to be protected. And I go to Dave Watson's point that if what we're about here is protecting consumers and ensuring that they can trust the food that they're buying, which derives from Scotland, then protection almost enshrined in the bill would be very helpful. There are never going to be nice to do things. There are always going to be things that are important and priorities, but nothing will be more important than food safety and finding some way of protecting the regimes that others might be more worried about than I might be in respect of what happens in other supply chains. I think it's really important that that should happen. One final observation on access. Charles makes a, an, a very sensible point, which is that, that government bodies can share access to committees. I would just encourage you to be bolder and to suggest that you don't want access, you want real influence, because some of those issues will be more important in Scotland than they might be in other parts of the United Kingdom, and you need to make sure, as a body, that those, those priorities are being met with the same enthusiasm as, as they might be being met now. That's very open. There are supplementary been thrown up that I would like to ask about. Rhoda, it's your question. Is there anything else you'd like I'm to come in Okay. So, again, I'm, I'm going to refer to, to Tesco, Mr Smith, simply because you're, you're sitting here. One of the things that's come up through evidence sessions is that the suggestion that um, large retailers may test what they know is safe rather than what might be risky. I'm not saying that is the case, but you can, there can be an affirming testing process. So, yeah, we, we, we think there's a, a food chain there. We think it's done very well. Let's test that. And it, it almost it validates what you think you already know rather than a risk-based approach to testing. I'm not saying that is the case, but those are suggestions that, that have been made. And also um, the idea of full disclosure. And I know there could be commercial issues around that. This full disclosure um, of... Because the more a large supermarket or a, a, you know, a large manufacturer is um, testing, the more breaches, by definition, the more breaches you'll find, because that, that's the world we live in, and the reputational damage that could exist by then reporting on that, but that would be very, very important information to inform Food Standards Scotland or the FSA as it currently is for that partnership working. So I don't know any information you have about whether, how comfortable you would feel if there was a, a duty to share um, uh, the, the, the testing process and, and, and what the balance is. So I, I know you're, you're, you're kind of here for Tesco, but more in, ge in more in general terms, and wh whether your view is that tests validate what people already think is safe, or how much of it is a kind of risk-based system to testing. Um, I'm happy to, to clarify what others may have thought we do. Um, first, I did mention that, Tesco. I have to say, it's no, just no, a, a general it, it, theme. But I think um, certainly 
from a, a customer perspective, let's go back to the events of, of horse meat. And what we're already doing and what we strengthened was that we were taking a very much risk-based approach to our auditing regime, our testing, our sampling, our surveillance on a very simple two-dimensional grid, likelihood and impact. So if, that, if a product had the potential to cause harm to human health if mad, badly handled, so a ready-to-eat sandwich, for example, or if um, there was a high likelihood, because we had intelligence that suggested that, there would be more work going into that area. And today, I think we've got 5,300 DNA tests up on our website, which display what we've tested, why we've tested it, and what we found. And we took that view, which is to your transparency point, because we thought, if there's one thing that would make consumers, our customers, feel more comfortable, it would be A, knowing that we were doing that and bringing that testing result to them. And secondly, that if there were that sampling surveillance testing regime, it would act as a deterrent to those who might possibly be tempted to do the things that, that happened during the horse meat um, uh, situation last year. So I think we were already doing it. I think we're already taking a risk-based and proportionate approach. Our investment has gone up substantially since because it's proved easier to identify the risks as we've shortened and made our, our supply chains simpler. But the important part of that is that if we weren't disclosing that information before to our customers, we are now. And that obviously then preempts any need really to do that with the regulator. But we did that anyway. So that would be a normal part of our daily, weekly, monthly regimes. And we're happy to share any of that kind of information with the proper bodies. That's really helpful. I know, Mr. Millen, is that your experience? The sector as a whole is doing that thing, or is Tesco being a bit more progressive than, say, some others in relation to this? No. I mean, I think it, it, I would find it hard to believe that industry would deliberately look uh, at samples they knew would be clear, because th th that's an awful lot of money that you're wasting at the end of the day. You'd want to. Uh, industry would certainly want to underpin uh, its knowledge and confidence in the food that uh, it buys and the ingredient it buys. Um, in terms of overall surveillance, I think uh, having access to industry sampling and an open and transparent sampling system is a tremendous benefit, uh, but it's one layer. I think uh, we need industry to sample, uh, and then local authorities across Scotland, we have a coordinated uh, sampling programme as well to underpin that uh, for verification, if you like. Um, uh, currently, uh, the Food Standards Agency is developing developing advice for ministers on what a world-leading surveillance, food surveillance system would look like, uh, and obviously uh, the, the lessons from that particular exercise will be very pertinent to the new food body. Um, now, uh, no other MSP who hasn't already asked a question has caught my eye to ask one, so if there isn't any, uh, Richard Lyle, you've got another question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, convener. Before I go on to my question, uh, I previously served in the Rural Affairs and Climate Change Committee, and uh, actually Scotland's food and drink is, uh, I would suggest, the, is the best in, in the world. And um, most companies, Tesco, Asda, Morrisons, uh, check their food daily, uh, you know, the dates, etc. And, and most... Uh, grocers, and uh, can I, I just put in a plea to the EHOs? Um, I go into my little uh, local uh, store uh, 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 sh uh, shop and uh, love to uh, select my rolls in the morning. So I hope you don't uh, have a situation where you're going to have the rolls covered because uh, it's, it's going to be that when we go into the grocery shop, you'll need to cover the apples and the pears and the bananas and everything else. Um, but can I come on to the serious question? The FSS uh, should have a structure that enables it to provide a service for all food and drink manufacturers. Who do you think should be on the board and how, what should the board be made up by? Um, people from the industry or people who take a great interest in the industry? Okay, so what should the board of the FSS look like and um, how do you feel about the provisions within the bill in relation to that? Any takers on that? Mr Smith. The, the critical piece is that anybody observing the new body would be able to detect the single purity of, it, the, of its independence. And that means that whilst the voices around the table would need to be drawn from within industry, within consumer bodies, within a whole range of academic and scientific backgrounds, 
it wouldn't matter if they were sitting around the table debating a specific issue where they were coming from. What they're adding is an independent clarity of question and purpose that holds the executive to account. It would be important, I think, to understand that um, it makes policy making a lot easier. It makes implementation more straightforward if there is expertise around the table where that expertise adds value. So if, if a huge amount of the work that goes on in Europe in the next few years might be about changes in meat regulation and how that might be applied in the UK, it would be strange, wouldn't it, if, if there were no bodies around the table or individuals who were able to bring that expertise to the table, as long as, with transparency and openness, it was clear to anybody looking in that they were acting in that independent manner. Anyone else? Yeah, Colette? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just support what, what Tim said. I mean, the, the important issue is that, as a consumer-facing body, that consumers have confidence in the, the agency and in its board. Um, the independence point is well made and is very, you know, a very, very important point. There needs to be breadth on the board to cover all the bases, if you like, and in some way a knowledge of industry who provide food to consumers must be captured in some way on that board and indeed within the organisation. Thank you very much, Laura Stewart. Um, yeah, all very sensible. Of course, the independence uh, point is really, really key to this. Um, the breadth, I would also add that food is such a cross-sectional issue that we need to make sure that, uh, to reflect the work of the FSS, we're going to need people that understand about health, as well as environment, as well about the social implications of food in our food system. OK, thank you very much. Dave Watson? Um, just to reassure Richard that... Uh, I think it would be unlikely, given cuts in environmental health, anyone's going to visit his, uh, his corner shop. Uh, I suspect Tesco's probably get more time focused on them in a risk and proportionate basis, and certainly not to worry about whether his roles are covered. Um, but the, uh, the more serious point is actually there's, a, there's also been a big cut in the amount of food sampling that's done by environmental health officers. So, you know, that's, that is, a, is, a, is another area where there's a problem. In terms of the board, one of the points we made in our evidence uh, convened was that, uh, yes, of course, it has to have a balance of expertise, but there's no mention in the, in the bill about staff governance, uh, and this is something that we've developed in Scotland, in, in, other, in other public bodies, uh, particularly the NHS and, el and elsewhere, where, st where a staff governance framework has been introduced, and that's involved, um, obviously, staff representation uh, on the board. Uh, frankly, the bill's almost, well, it's, it's, it's virtually entirely silent on the subject of people. You would have thought that food inspection is done by robots, not by people, but... Uh, it is actually done by people, so we'd like to have seen a little bit more about staff governance in the bill, um, including issues around staff transfer and others which, uh, which seem to be missed out. Can I just ask you on that, Mr Lee, in a second, could some of that be picked up in guidance, do you think? Uh, well, it could. Um, it, normally in these arrangements, for example, there is a statutory uh, requirement. It says there shall be a staff governance framework. Then you have the secondary guidance that okay. picks that up. So all we're looking for in the bill is a, is a general statement of staff governance and leave the detail to secondary legislation. That's very helpful, Mr Lee. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Kevin. A very good question by Mr Lyle. And just to say briefly, um, at the risk of making it a very crowded table, it would be useful if retailers could be represented on it in some way and bring their expertise and their, their, their knowledge to bear. Okay, any other of our witnesses want to come in on in relation to that? Okay, can, can I just um, sneak in a small supplementary I did last time, Richard, in relation to that. Uh, also within the bill is not, is not just the, 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 the appointment of the Chief Executive and, and that, that kind of top-tier committee, but also... Uh, a permissive power for various committees as they see fit. Does everyone have to be represented, if you like, I hate the language, at that top table, or could there be roles for other committees, so, you know, stakeholder groups, an industry reference group, food producer reference group, that kind of thing? Does everyone have to be sitting... And this comes up in everything we ever discuss at this committee. You know, you, you, would, you would have to build a, a table the size of the Scottish Parliament to get everyone round that table that wants to be on the, 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 that board. So... Could the, the committee's system be a, a way of making sure, if you're not at that top table, so to speak, to, to reinforce the language that I don't particularly like, that the committees can be used to make sure everyone has some form of representation? See, nod, nod, nodding heads, I don't have any comments. Colette? 
Just, just very briefly on that point, I mean, c committees work very well, there's no doubt about that, but at the end of the day, they are primarily advisory committees, and the decisions are taken at the top table. So what's really important is that that top table has the breadth and balance to properly represent all of the stakeholders involved, and actually to ensure that there's an appropriate challenge at the top table, so that where things are being proposed to be implemented, that there are people there who can say, hang on, that's not going to work because, and that, that applies across all aspects of the, of the agency's work, not just in relation to industry. Okay, no, I just wanted to ask the question because there is a, and it's not, it's not actually about this bill per se, it's everything we've ever scrutinised around this committee, it, the, 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 there's a clamour to be at that, 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 that particular table. Um, I don't have any other questions from committee members. Is there anyone? Nene, of course. What, 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 what would be the ideal size of the board in numerical terms? Very good question, because you might say six and then 20 groups want in it. So, yeah, you, to, make, to make it fleet of foot but still be appropriately representative, how big should the board be? Any takers? Silence. I think the only thing to say is that, that, that there are so many different areas of expertise that you cannot realistically expect a representative uh, of, of all. Yeah. So uh, it's, uh, it's about the type of people that are on the board. They've got to be questioning. They've got to you know, have the attitude of putting the consumer first. Um, but also they have to have access to information from the executive uh, and more broadly to inform their decisions. Um, I, I would agree you don't want to make the committee too big. You need, you need a reasonable mix of expertise on, on the committee, but if you make it too big, it'll become very un unwieldy. Okay, that's more of a politician's answer than a politician. That's, that's excellent. Mr. Lyle, so, oh, sorry. No, no, it's, so, so, Richard, Richard, sorry, sorry. Apologies, Richard. Yeah, so, so, Mr. Smith, um, got, Richard, hang on a second. Mr. Smith wants to come in there. Sorry. I was going to, I was going to say that independence and putting the consumer first have, have been mentioned a number of times, including by me. And if in doubt, go for that. Because science and evidence gathering, people who understand the science, people who understand the industry, retailers obviously, manufacturers, the whole supply chain will need to be represented. But if customers are to trust, consumers are to trust this body, it has to be seen to be independent, I keep saying that, but more importantly I think that it needs to feel like the people who, are, who work is being done on behalf of are represented around the table. That's Richard. Apologies for cutting you off. You no, uh, uh, it's okay, Candina. I've been uh, cut off by better people than you. Um, <laughs> basically, <laughs> um, basically, can I uh, agree with Mr Smith at the end of the day? It's got to be within me. But I, I think the chance uh, has to be... I understand Mr Mulney, a very politician's answer. Um, I understand prior to uh, starting Mr Mulney's uh, leaving and going to Australia, and, and I wish I assure her everyone around the table wishes you well and, and thanks you for the, the job that you've previously done with the Food Standards Agency Scotland and with your expertise could you not just tell us before you go how many people should be on the board? <laughs> Mr Millen, feel free to answer that or not as the case may be. An appropriate number. <laughs> <laughs> An appropriate number. Well, um, I suppose one of the most important things, of course, is that Richard Lyle's roles, morning roles, are uncovered. And if we can achieve anything today, can we perhaps achieve that? You know, listen, th thank you, everyone, for, for, for uh, participating in, in, in this round table. As always, it's, it's ongoing scrutiny. So, um, as Duncan McNeill, our convener, would always say at this point, I I'll say as well, if there's something you thought I should have said that on the way home, then, you know, put it in evidence and give it give it back to us again. We do have a tiny bit of time. I'm not uh, soliciting any final comments from witnesses, but um, we do have a tiny bit of time if there's any final comments you want to put on the record before I formally close uh, what is now this afternoon's meeting. I'll take that as a resounding uh, mandate to close the meeting. So thank you very much. Meeting closed.